Hi, I'm Chris Haroon, and this MBA Hi, I'm Chris Haroon, and this MBA degree program is not what you think it is. It's better. This program is more than 25 years of business experience, all rolled into one easy to access online program. I've sold over 1 million courses in every single country. I worked at Goldman Sachs. I have an MBA from Columbia University, and I've worked in the venture capital, hedge fund, and consulting industries. I've also started many companies, and my courses have been featured in Forbes, Business Insider, CNN, and NBC. If you're ready to nail your next interview, get a better job, get a raise, start that business you've always dreamt of, improve the one you currently run, or better manage your personal finances, then this MBA degree program is for you. I can't begin to tell you how comprehensive this program is. It's got everything, including more than 300 hours of on-demand video. I would have to do one of those dramatic opening title crawls from a certain space movie just to show you. And check out all the amazing reviews from students who have already enrolled in this MBA degree program. This on-demand version of the program is only $499, and it's more up-to-date than many of these old-fashioned MBA programs, which cost you well over $100,000. Not to mention, they don't even teach you the practical concepts included in my program. Last but not least, there is a 30-day, 100% money-back guarantee. And because you can access this program from any device, meaning a desktop computer, or a laptop computer, or a tablet, or even your smartphone. It means you can comfortably fit it into your schedule. Even if you work full time, it's no problem. So if you're ready to unlock the key to your potential, then I'll see you in class. Good morning and welcome to our 94th weekly webcast. I'm so sorry we started a couple minutes late there. We had technical difficulties with YouTube. I found a workaround through what's called an RMTP server. That's me nerding out. I apologize. Even with week 94, I have issues. So anyway, trying to push the goalpost out. I make mistakes a lot and YouTube's having issues as well, to be honest. So if this is the first time you're joining this call, welcome. If you've been with us before, welcome back. And so the way the call works is this is an AMA, uh, which means ask me anything. You can ask me business questions. You can ask me personal questions. You can ask me career questions. You can ask me anything. And the call ends in about three hours. Now, within 24 hours of the call being completed, what you can do actually is you can go back to this same YouTube page you watched this video on, go to the description field, and you'll see all the questions have been typed up. Uh, my team has typed up thousands and thousands of questions over the past 94 weeks, including my weekly webcast and my MBA degree uh, program. I think I've done close to a thousand hours of online video. Um, so anyway, um, if I don't answer your question, 
and I skip it by accident, just ask it again, please, because I do answer the questions uh, in, in the order in which I receive them. Again, you can ask me business questions, career questions, personal questions, anything you want to. So without further ado, let's begin. And thanks again for your patience today. Thank you. All right. Uh, first question uh, I've got here uh, is at 6.27 a.m. Now, when I got up this morning hours ago, there's a ton of questions from around 2 and 3 a.m. If you enter them that early, they'll actually get lost in the queue. So just try to enter them within a couple hours or two hours or so before the call starts. Okay, thank you. Okay, first question uh, is from Hizzy, uh, who's saying, Dear Chris, I recently completed your investing training program and I found it to be excellent. Thank you. Could you please share your thoughts on the merger arbitrage strategy and, poss and possibly other strategies? Yeah, sure. So what happens usually um, with hedge funds, and hedge funds are, are big investment firms that can make money when stocks go up and go down. There's different types of hedge funds and different types of hedge fund divisions within larger hedge funds. One type of division is called ED, which stands for event driven. And what that means is whenever there's a big event, uh, like uh, one company tries to acquire the other company, then what happens is the hedge fund gets involved and tries to see if they can profit from it. And, and I'll give you an example. And I worked on many mergers over the years from a hedge fund perspective. And so arbitrage, we know, means making money from something that's a little bit undervalued or sometimes a lot. And so the way it works is this. Uh, years ago, I think it was in 05, um, I owned Adobe and Macromedia. And Macromedia, the ticker was M-A-C-R. It's the company that makes Flash, Dreamweaver, etc. You might notice those program names uh, within the Adobe Creative Suite. And so what happened was uh, Adobe bought Macromedia in 2005. And what happened was, I'm going to make numbers up here. Let's say that Macromedia stock price uh, was $5 when the deal was announced. And the deal was announced for $10. They're going to buy the company for $10. So Macromedia's share price went up, not to 10 bucks, but a little bit below it. And the reason it, it actually opened up or went up just below the, pr the price uh, where Adobe mentioned they wanted to acquire them at uh, is because a lot of hedge fund investors, many of which are lawyers, believe that maybe there's a possibility that the deal's not going to get approved by the Department of Justice in the United States. In Europe, it's called the EU. And so what happened was there was a little bit of a discount below 10 bucks. And so what event-driven funds do is if they think that deal's going to go through, they buy a ton of macromedia, the company getting acquired, and then they short a lot of Adobe, uh, the company buying Macromedia in this example, which occurred back in 2005. And the reason that they buy a, a ton of Macromedia is because it's at a bit of a discount to the $10 takeout premium. Again, it's at a discount because a lot of people think maybe the deal won't go through. And so what happens is there's an arbitrage opportunity to close that spread. Let's say the stock is at $9.50 and it's supposed to be taken out at 10 bucks. And so what happens is hedge funds to hedge their bets, they short a lot of Adobe, the acquiring company. Um, and then what they do is they go long, meaning they buy the company being acquired. And when the deal gets approved, if it does, then what happens is that small gap between $9.50 and $10 closes. And just to hedge their bets, they're short the company acquiring just because they can't be you know, 100% net long. They have to have shorts as well because they're a hedge fund in their charter, right? Their fiduciary duty is to protect capital and not be too long the market. And so once the deal is approved, that um, that spread narrows to zero, meaning 10 bucks, goes right up to 10 bucks. Um, and sometimes what happens is the stock goes a little bit above that $10 level if the market thinks that there might be other companies that are going to uh, try to acquire um, macromedia in this example. And this happened a lot, actually, with um, SAP and Oracle fighting with each other. Now, they're, they're two great companies. SAP is based in Waldorf, Germany, and Oracle is based here in Redwood City, California. And they compete neck and neck. And sometimes SAP will announce that they want to buy a company at this price. 
And then what will happen is Oracle will come in and say, no, no, I want to get it at this price. Larry, Larry Ellison's awesome. He's very competitive. So that explains um, uh, event-driven hedge funds and, and how they work and, and arbitrage from a, a merger perspective. Now, quite often, people know the deal is going to go through, or they think it is, because there's what's called a breakup value. Uh, and a breakup value, or a, a, a breakout, a breakup expense, I should say, is if the deal doesn't go through, uh, then there's penalties that must be paid by one of the two parties. And it's just to ensure that the deal actually goes through. And this happens in non-hostile acquisition bits. So that explains merger arbitrage. Uh, if you have additional questions about that or anything else, please let me know. Thank you as always. Okay, Pablo is asking, hi. First of all, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, I love all of your content. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. And I'm so sorry for the technical issue I had this morning with, with YouTube, but we're up and running. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Um, and, and your question is, uh, I love all of your content. I want to be a service designer and I want to know if you use any design methodologies or mindsets in your processes. Yeah. So when it comes to design in general, uh, there, there's something um, that Isaac Newton discovered after he discovered gravity at Cambridge University years ago. Just kidding. Um, actually went to that. I went to Cambridge with a buddy of mine, Rob Percival, who's a teacher on Udemy. And he showed me where the apple fell off the tree on Sir Isaac Newton's head when, again, he invented gravity because we floated before that. But what, what happened was he, he, he got some light and he shone it through a prism, glass. And he noticed uh, that a color wheel was created. And this is very important for design principles. Uh, and I'll explain why. So when you look at design principles, and I use this a lot, I'm using it right now with these colors behind me, which I'll explain in a second. But when you use design principles, what you do is you look at the color wheel and the color wheel works best when you use opposite colors. So I'll show you. I'll spell color like Canadian. Color wheel. Here it is here. Okay, great. And so... The color wheel, uh, and I apologize, I'm kind of covering it up here. What I'll do is I'll, I'll go over here, this one. Okay. So what happens with design is colors that are opposite each other tend to look really, really good. And so they can be roughly opposite each other or close enough. And so I try to do that today with roughly yellow uh, and blue. Okay. Bluish. They're somewhat opposite on, on a right color uh, wheel. Here we go here. Yeah, yeah. Close enough. Close enough. They look really good together. Uh, and what happens is a, a lot of companies that make candies for kids, um, like Nerds, for example, what they'll do is they'll use bright colors from the color wheel and use the opposites because opposites attract. Some of the best ones actually are yellow and purple, uh, which looks quite good. So that, those are some design principles uh, that, that I think are, are really, really important um, if, if you want to be a serious YouTuber. Um, when you make thumbnail images, or if you want to create great graphic design. Another thing I'll tell you is that if you ever see sans serif or sans serif <laughs> fonts, you want to use those, okay? Serif fonts are bad. And sans in French means um, without. So sans serif means without serif. And what a serif font is, is a font that's hard to read, that has little squiggly lines on it. Uh, and so if you have the option of using a serif versus a non-serif version of a font, always use non-serif. And Steve Jobs' favorite um, a text um, or font, I should say, was always Helvetica. Helvetica, hell yeah. And I agree. And so I love to use Helvetica all in caps because it's a sans serif font or sans serif, <laughs> meaning there's no squiggly lines uh, in the corner. So those are a couple of um, important designer methodologies. Um, if you have additional questions about this, um, please let me know. And thank you as always. Saying is saying, hi, Chris. Hey, man. And you wrote, I hope you're great. Uh, on the MBA program, are you going to add more hours of content as it goes along? And how much more? Yeah, about, about six hours a week. Yeah. So I'll, I'll show you what this means. So for those of you um, th that are wondering uh, about what this MBA degree program means, I launched it in December. And basically, um, there's a couple different versions. And the best way to explain it is to go to my website, haruneducation.com, and then click here on MBA program. 
Uh, and then here's the, the pricing and the FAQs. Uh, and so the pricing, if you want to start today, you can. It's $499. It's on demand. And I'll show you the lectures in a minute. And you get a 30-day 100% money back guarantee. So you can binge watch and ask for your money back. I don't care. Um, and again, you can start today. And this is over 300 hours. And you can always mouse over here. Uh, to find out um, more details in the program. By the way, this is a little plug-in I, I put on my website when I made my website, so I don't have to code any of this stuff. It's like eight bucks a month for all this great stuff here. The next SKU or version is, now you could start the silver version today and it'll take you less than a year to complete or more than a year, whatever you want. Then there's also the gold version right here. And the gold version is exactly like the silver version, except you have to apply uh, to get accepted. And it starts every December and lasts one year. And in the gold version, it's exactly what the silver version is, except I do several hundred hours of live Q&A, like I'm doing right now after each lecture. And the next one starts on December 14th. And so in, in the current program I have, uh, when I started December of uh, 19 or 2019, feels like last century, um, I have um, 158 students. Two of them ask for their money back. And so if you want to know about deadlines, when to apply for this uh, gold version, you can just mouse over here or go to my website. There's a lot more details on this. Again, it's haruneducation.com. Now, the difference between the highest end version, which is the platinum, which is $14.99, is you get everything you get here, plus several hours of one-on-one -on -one meetings with me, either in person or using Zoom. Uh, and so I, I, I'm doing a bunch of one-on-one -on -one calls today after this, uh, this call is done with a bunch of my MBA degree students that are currently uh, in, in the Platinum program. Now, if you want more details on the FAQs or frequently asked questions, just scroll down here and read all about this. Um, and then here's student testimonials. And one of the reasons I, I made this MBA degree program is because it really upset me with traditional MBA schools, how a lot of times they teach you stuff you cannot apply in the real world or not enough stuff. You know, they, they don't teach you how to manage your own money. They teach you how to manage other people's money. They don't teach you how to present, which is important. They don't teach you how to sell, sell, sell from your heart. They don't teach you how to network and they don't teach you a lot of new social media stuff that I can teach you, including how to set up a backdrop, uh, a, a room like this, using what you have and nothing else. And as Seth Godin said, and I have this great quote on my wall, and he's the best marketing person on the planet, he said, you already have everything you need to build something far bigger than yourself, and I believe it. So when you sign up for the MBA degree program, there's no additional fees at all. We use what you have equipment-wise. If you have an iPhone or an Android handset, and you have internet access, which you all do, you can make a great video setup like this. That's right, and, and I'll teach you exactly how. I'll teach you all these skills. I'll also teach you finance and accounting in a really, really fun way, an innovative way. Uh, and so far this year, uh, in the silver version, um, I've published 127 hours of content, but I have a lot more to do. And again, I add about six hours per week. Now, if you want, you can read through, and I'll go, show you the curriculum in a second. You can read through, uh, reviews I have from a lot of my students that are currently uh, taking the program from all over the world. You can click on their, their profiles for LinkedIn profiles, learn about them. Uh, contact them if you want as well. They're, they're more than happy to talk to you. They're not compensated to do this. They just want to help and um, I, I love them dearly. Yeah, from all over the world. Now, if we go back to, um, let me go back to my homepage here and let me click here on enroll today. So again, the price is is $4.99. Um, and then what you do is you can scroll down here and learn all about the program. Okay. Frequently asked questions, a lot of testimonials, which you saw before as well from all over the world. And you can contact any of these people. They'd be more than happy to uh, provide the positives and negatives too. Ask them what are the negatives about the program too, please. I want to be intellectually honest about this whole process. And as always, you get a 30 day, 100%, no questions asked, money back guarantee. Now, in terms of, um, there's a lot of them, yeah. <laughs> They're great. So here's the curriculum here. You can scroll down and you can look at a lot of sample lectures. And usually with a lot of my Udemy courses and other courses I teach, I make about 10% free, just so you can 
see what you're getting yourself into. And I really believe humbly that you need to add a lot of value to customers before they purchase your product in this new digital reality. So if I don't add value and you don't learn stuff from watching these free previews, please don't take the, the degree program. Now, what you can do is it, it goes on forever, right? It's really, really long. I've, I've recorded just a, a ton of it. Um, and then what I wrote here is note to students from Chris Harwin, Harun, is that how you say that? Just kidding. We will add six hours of additional brand new content every single week in 2020. And I record it uh, in 4K. You might be watching it in 1080, depending on your device. And I have 4K cameras everywhere, as you know. Uh, and I use pedals to change the angles and all that stuff. It's nicely edited, though. This this live thing I'm doing right now is not as nicely edited as my MBA degree program is. Also, I wanted to show you just to make it accessible for everybody. First of all, you can take it on a, on a desktop, a laptop, a tablet, your iPhone, and your Android handset. I set up every lecture like that because I want to be inclusive of everybody on the planet. And I've also added advanced closed captions to every single lecture. Okay, so it looks like this. You don't get these nice neon signs here, but I'll open a lecture and show you in a second what that means. You get a degree at the end of the program as well from me. Um, you also get, uh, let me see what else. I'm teaching using 3D objects as well. It's a lot of fun. Let's see, what are some other samples? I use a lot of props as well. I've, I've gone to town and bought a ton of props. Uh, this is where I was teaching about bonds and bond trading and investing in bonds, etc. This is a real balance sheet, a real scale that I bought from China. I'm just having fun with it too. Um, and then I did a lot of woodwork as well to explain um, accounting and finance in a fun way that's never been taught before. I make a fool of myself as well wearing many hats because in this case study, I'm an investment wanker, banker. Um, and I'm working on the merger of a couple of companies. I'm showing you how they, how they work. We talk a lot about a lot of different fun, uh, uh, strategies when it comes to um, analyzing companies. Uh, we also analyze the heck out of stocks. We model stocks. We do a lot more stuff that I don't teach in as much detail in my other courses. Here we're working on the hostile or the merger, I should say, or acquisition of, of Marvel by Disney. Uh, and then we talk about how Disney declared Chapter 11. Um, years ago, and Carl Icahn, a great activist investor, made, I think, a billion dollars off that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's graphical. It's fun. Um, again, there's a 30-day, 100% money-back guarantee. Let me show you a, a lesson. Let me just go to a sample one here. Whoops. There's a lot going on here. A lot of lessons, eh? All right. Um, go near the beginning. Why is cash a terrible investment? Okay. Uh, and this, is, I'll have it on mute here because I don't want to disrupt the audio in the webcast. But if I go here. Okay. Um, oh, actually, I do have the audio on. All right. Over here uh, in my hand. Here's closed caption I just turned on. 10 billion Zimbabwe dollars. Okay. This used to be worth something. Now, and let me just clear this up so you can see it. We'll zoom in here for you. I do top down as 10 well. 10 billion dollars. I'm now holding $10 trillion, okay, from Zimbabwe. Again, this used to be worth something as well. All right, now let me here. mute this this ugly guy. <laughs> and then I'm going to go here. You won't be able to see in the... Actually, let me get rid of my, my, my face here. Hold on a second so you can actually see what's going on in the corner. All right, good. Whoops. Sorry about that. Hold on. <laughs> it's been one of those days, guys. All right. So over here, you can see that the closed captions are on. Now, if I wanted to, I can actually search the videos here. So if I click search the video, right? We're talking about um, money. So I'll search for the word money. <laughs> and you'll see there's 10 instances of the word money. So you can always fast forward to the word money and watch what happens down here when I click here. It'll jump forward to there. There we go. So it jumps forward to here, okay? So it's all indexed. These are the highest quality closed captions I've gotten added. Um, I, I spent a lot of money on this. Um, I, I really, really believe that it will make a difference and you'll thoroughly enjoy the process um, or, or your money back or your money back. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, give me one second. I'm going to scroll down to see if there's any issues with people complaining about audio, video, etc. All right. Good. We're good to go. Great. Awesome. All right. Uh, and uh, next one's from uh, Ankit, who's saying, uh, hi, Chris. Thank you for your uh, amazing sessions. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Thanks. 
Um, and the next question is, um, you don't have any marketing courses? Question mark at the end. Um, I do. I do. I actually, um, if you go to Udemy, um, you can see that I've, I've got a course um, on, it's called a complete YouTube course. Uh, and I set it up actually with one of my amazing students that I met on the 10th weekly call. Right now we're in week uh, 94. And her name is Sasha Stevenson. And she's a fellow Canadian. I've never met her. But she lives in Indonesia and she has over 100 million views. She's amazing. And if you want to learn more about uh, that course, uh, just, just, go to, um, just go to Udemy, do, do a search on my name. So the easiest way to get there is just go Udemy, Chris Haroon, and then you can go to my page here. Uh, and then what you can do is just kind of scroll through to see all the courses. And so it's loading. Here, here it is down. Here it is here. Yeah. So in this course, um, well, it's over 18 hours. We teach you everything you need to know about how to set up YouTube and YouTube videos. And I believe that YouTube is the only, the only gold rush in history where it costs you absolutely nothing to make the product. And it's the only gold rush in history where you can actually get access to billions of potential viewers for free or customers for free. It's a gold rush. It is. And I think the cornerstone of a marketing strategy and social media strategy um, should start with YouTube. And then after that, you work on what's called repurposing content, uh, meaning you reuse what, you, what you've created. And so for me, what I do, and many of you probably realize this, is every week I hold this call. And we're on week 94 now. And it's three hours. Then what I do is I have seven vlogs for the next week made from this. And from this, I also have a podcast made as well as short Twitter videos, short Instagram videos, and much, much more. And so you have to think about what's called repurposing of content uh, if, if you want to be uh, successful with, with, with digital marketing and, and advertising. And so Nintendo's been repurposing content forever. And Nintendo is the oldest tech company in the world. It's like 130 years old. They obviously weren't always a tech company. They were a playing card company. Uh, and much, much more. But what Nintendo's been doing is it's a high margin business because they take their older content and they repurpose it. Kind of like I'm explaining with putting YouTube videos on different social media platforms. I'll give you an example. So with the 8-bit 8 8-bit um, uh, Super NES or, or Nintendo system, I should say, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the 80s, they created um, Mario, uh, Super Mario. And then they made a 60-bit version a couple of years later and then Mario 64 which is the best Mario ever. I love it. But anyway, they, they repurpose all that content on different platforms. They used to put it on Game Boy, then Game Boy Advance, then the DS. They got rid of the DS. Now it's on the Switch. It's on the older Wii and the Wii U, et cetera. You get the idea. And so think about it from Nintendo's perspective whenever you create content uh, for your marketing strategy. Create the content. And then the way to work smarter, not harder, and the way to do it with higher profit margins is you just reuse that content on different platforms. You repurpose it. And so that's just some of the, the marketing concepts I teach. I, I do teach a lot more about, uh, about marketing in my, uh, my, my MBA degree program, uh, including stuff that's just not available in other courses, of course. Yeah. All right. But I would start with, with that one. That's what I recommend. All right. Um, actually, there, there's a guy, if you want marketing, there's actually two guys that are way better than me uh, on Udemy. Uh, there's actually, I'll show you, uh, there's, uh, uh Diego Davila, uh, and there's also, uh, Evan Kimbrell. They're, they're great. I'll show you. All right. Let me start with Evan. Cause he's got the best courses. So we go Evan Kimbrell. All right. And so if you go to just do a search on him and you'll see a lot of courses here. Yeah. So uh, he's great at marketing, man. This guy rocks too, uh, in product management, but here's a great Instagram course and he runs circles around me on this stuff. So, so check out, uh, Evan's courses, please. Uh, they're, they're amazing. They're better than mine when it comes to marketing and probably everything too, actually. Uh, you can also go and look at Diego. Okay. So Diego Davila, great guy. And dude, Diego is a powerhouse, man. He's a good dude as well, but he teaches in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. I have enough trouble with English. But he's got a lot of, uh, oh, Phil Ebner as well is great with this stuff. Uh, digital marketing, uh, Instagram as well. Um, the reason there's two pictures is because Phil partnered with uh, Diego and vice versa there. Both great guys. 
Um, yeah. Uh, oh, and here's uh, here's uh, Chris Dutton. He teaches Excel better than anybody uh, on the planet. Uh, so I would just go here to check out the, the marketing courses. I, I think they're fantastic. And if you want something really technical uh, from a marketing perspective, you can take Rob Percival's. And I don't get comp for saying this. Udemy is just, it, it's an algorithm. So either my courses sell or they don't. I never get comp by anybody. I just want to help if I humbly can't. Um, so Rob Percival has got fantastic courses on marketing. Here's one here. It's called the Complete Digital Marketing Course. 12 courses uh, in, in one. Um, so anyway, uh, look at this. He's got an insane number of students here as well. Uh, and this course is really, really long as well. It's 24 hours. It's great. They're all great. They're all great. So I, I, I recommend checking out uh, their marketing courses uh, and you can also join my MBA degree program or take my YouTube course, which has a 30-day 100% money-back guarantee. Thank you. Next one's from uh, Dr. Goldie. Uh, is thinking, um, is saying, sorry, um, hi, Chris. Uh, thank you for all the great content you put out. My, my, my pleasure. Thank you. And thanks for, for joining us as well. Saloni in the house. Saloni, how are you? Saloni's saying, hello, Chris. Hey, what are some of the greatest marketing strategies used by companies? Uh, eager, eagerly awaiting your, your marketing course. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, it, and actually, I'm, I'm partnering with um, one of the largest, uh, it's not public yet, I can't say it, uh, but uh, I'm partnering with one of the largest banks in the United States, and, and we're putting up several courses on, on Udemy, one of which is going to cover uh, marketing. It's, it's a joint venture. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, and for those of you that work uh, at companies and you want to provide education for your uh, your employees, there's something called Udemy for Business, UFB. Check it out. It's a subscription service. It, it's amazing. It's great. It's great. And it's the best investment you can make in your students as well. Okay. So the question is, what are some of the uh, greatest marketing strategies used by companies? Yeah. So I would say that... Um, I think controversy works exceptionally well, and it's it's free marketing. And I'll give you some examples. So um, Mark Benioff, um, who is the founder of the largest employer here in San Francisco, a wonderful human being and a great humanitarian. So Mark uh, Mark uh, Benioff started a company called Salesforce.com in 1999. And I remember meeting with him before they went public, uh, after they went public, et cetera. I invested in the company. It's an amazing company. But what Mark did early on, uh, and by the way, he was, he was a rock star as, as a kid too. When, when he was 26, he was the youngest vice president in Oracle history. He left Oracle to start Salesforce. What he did was he decided that traditional software is dead, like bloated software you run on your computer because cloud computing is more intelligent of a way to distribute software because you get automatic upgrades and we never realize it. And so traditional software was dead. And when he created Salesforce, it was a cloud company and nobody knew what the cloud was at the time. But what he did was his logo, beside his logo, he had the word software with a line crossed through it. And he said, software is dead. And it was brilliant because it was somewhat controversial and correct and ahead of its time. And so he ended up getting a ton of interviews uh, on television, newspapers, et cetera. Uh, and you can read his book called Above the Clouds, where he talks about many principles on why he became successful. One of them is controversy and making friends with many different people in the media. And so he was so controversial in a good way and so engaging and passionate in his delivery that a lot of people interviewed him. And so he got free publicity. He still does it now on CNB, CNBC, I think, with, with Jim Cramer, et cetera. Um, so that, that's what he did. Now, I think the best way to get marketing for your company for free is to network a lot, okay? Uh, and be somewhat controversial too. And I have a book. It's a free book. It's right there on my shelf, which you can download for free which teaches you everything you need to know about networking. So you can get meetings with people that work at various um, media publications. It's easy to do. Uh, again, you can get it for free. Go to my website to download it. It's haruneducation.com. Um, I promise you this networking stuff works and, and it's free, it's free. So I want you to network to meet people that work in the media that you have something in common with. 
And I promise you can get these meetings. Again, read the book. It's over 200 pages with several hours of YouTube videos that are clickable from within it. Uh, and it works. I, I put my reputation on a lot. So I want you to take Mark Benioff's uh, methodology of controversy. I'm going to go by controversy, leveraging the media. And I want you to couple that, so to speak, with my teachings on networking, which is free back there. I promise you it'll help. Other examples of being controversial in marketing uh, include um, Sir Richard Branson. I love that guy. I listen to all of his audiobooks. He oozes positivity. He's amazing. I've never met anybody that works at a virgin company of his that's a jerk. They're all very, very positive people. I love the corporate culture. Corporate culture usually comes from the founder if the founder is still engaged around the company. Now, what Mark Benny or what uh, <laughs> Sir Richard Branson did was he declared the war a war on Coca Cola back in the eighties. Um, and so what he did was he rented a tank and he created something called Virgin Cola, which didn't work out, but it was brilliant marketing anyway. And he rented a tank and he drove into Times Square. And of course you can't do this today, but he did it back in the 80s. He rented a tank, drove into Times Square with uh, Virgin Cola cans all over it. And he declared war on Coca-Cola. And he got a lot of PR for it. It was free PR. You can't buy that publicity. So um, there's that. And there's other things too, like... If I were to market my my MBA degree program, uh, it'd be controversial, which I, I don't think I will. Maybe I will. But I could do it by saying Harvard Business School, which is HBS. I could say two-thirds of Harvard Business School is BS. What about Haroon Business School? Okay, forget about that example. It's called Haroon Education Ventures MBA degree program, not HBS. Just kidding. But you get the idea. I think that being very controversial helps a lot. Um, and I think in this digital new reality we live in, you have to actually add value to your customers from a marketing perspective before they trust you and feel comfortable buying your products. It's very competitive. Uh, and so I think the best marketing strategies for small businesses is creating YouTube videos. And when you create these YouTube videos, you have to do it right from your heart, you know, not with profit in mind. You have to want to help. You want to help your, 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 your viewers. And, and there's a great book, and, and I'll wrap up this comment with a discussion on it, this great book called Give and Take, which stipulates that the poorest 1% of people in the world, people like my heroes, like uh, Mother Teresa, God bless her, the poorest 1% of people in the world are givers. They give with their hearts. The middle 98% of people in the world are takers. They're, they're avaricious. Most, most people take and never, never, never give. Now, the top 1% of people in the world um, by wealth, and it doesn't mean I respect you more because you're wealthy, but you can quantify it. The top 1% of people in the world are givers uh, and, and they want to help people. And, and that's why they became successful. That, amongst other reasons. You know, some people call it karma. Some people call it karma, synchronicity, whatever. Um, but giving you will receive, it's prophetic and it's been true since the beginning of time. So you need to give a lot uh, to your, your customers or potential customers from a marketing perspective through free YouTube videos, etc. If you add value in the long run, they will buy your product, kind of like Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. All right, I gotta get some coffee here, man. All right, next question. Um, next question is, do I think that the United Kingdom is better out of the European Union? It's a tough call. I, I, don't, I don't really know, know the answer. I don't, I'm sorry. Very, very tough call. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I thought initially when it happened that because the United Kingdom is, is a separate island. It's not physically attached um, to uh, the rest of the continent. There was some kind of, I don't know, kind of a, a culturally we're, we're on our own sort of thing. We're, we're proud to be independent uh, mentality, but I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer, actually. Sorry. We'll see. I do know that it, it's caused me some, some issues uh, with um, my patents and copy, or my copyrights and trademarks. So I, I tried to, I tried, I copyrighted my, my courses, all my content, my MBA degree program, all my brand names, um, all that sort of thing. 
And I was able to do it in most places in the world. And by the way, the way you can do it on the cheap is you can go to LegalZoom.com. I never get compensated, as you know, uh, for mentioning any of this stuff. But you can go to LegalZoom.com uh, and you can ask an IP or intellectual property lawyer to help you. Uh, and so I got them to help me a lot. And they were great. And so we filed here domestically in the United States. And then when we looked overseas, it's complicated. But what happened was in the late 1980s um, in, in Spain, uh, the leaders of 100 countries got together and they created what's called the Madrid Protocol, which basically means if you honor my copyrights and intellectual property, I will honor yours as well. And so that was awesome. It was awesome. It meant that um, All right, I'm back. I'm back. Yeah. I had to throttle down my, my webcast. My webcast, I used to broadcast them in 1440, which is close to 4K which is the highest you can do. Now we're down to 1080. We're good, though. We're, we're, we're fine. We're fine. All right. And I've noticed also that a lot of companies' customer support has kind of fallen off a cliff just because of COVID, which is completely understandable, completely understandable. But um, it's tough to get good support these days, so it's always good to have a backup plan like I did this morning uh, with, with my webcast. I've, I've got multiple computers, um, and multiple software products. And the way to actually do what I'm showing you right now, uh, the way to do all this stuff is you can either use um, a product called Wirecast, which is what I'm using right here, or you can use a free product called OBS, which stands for Open Broadcasting Software. Uh, and so I use both. Uh, I always have backups just in case, just in case, yeah. All right. As Andy Grove said, only the paranoid survive, right? From a business perspective. Okay, next question is, what are the most essential soft technology or computer skills uh, pretty much every employer uh, looks for? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know, like soft technology that I don't, I don't know if I, I, I know what that means. Um, I, I would say soft skills uh, in general uh, means people that... Um, can can present, uh, can can string together logic properly in front of customers. Can they sell? Um, can they manage others? Can they motivate other people? Now, from um, a computer skill perspective, I, I would say the basics, Microsoft Office or Google Sheets or whatever it is, um, just to be able to create financial models uh, and quantify stuff. Um, but if you're talking about, um, it depends on the job. Like if it's a, if it's a design job, then anything Adobe based, um, creative suite wise or Photoshop wise is important. Uh, if you're a programmer, it depends on, on what sector the company is in. Uh, what, what I do recommend doing though is, is learning Python. I also recommend learning how to create apps and the easiest way to do this. And anybody can do this. I don't care how old or young you are or how technical or non-technical you are, what you can do is you can go to Udemy and just do a search. Um, I'll give you a great teacher here, Angela Yu. She teaches insanely great uh, courses. Uh, so she teaches you how to create websites from scratch in a lot of detail. This course is 53 hours. Her, dude, her ratings are off the charts. So she's amazing. She's a doctor, she lives in England which means she speaks gooder than me. But she used to be a, a medical doctor, yeah. Uh, and then what she decided was that she's just not passionate about that, and she's passionate about teaching, kind of like I am. Um, and, and so she decided to start teaching. She teaches great courses on how to program from scratch. Um, so she also teaches on, on, on machine learning. Uh, she partners with others. Uh, she teaches how to, how to code for apps for iOS, Android, etc. So check out her courses. She, she, she's wonderful. Yeah. And anybody can retool and learn online for a very, very low price. Yeah. yeah. All right. Next one is good morning, Chris. Good morning. Hope all is well. Thank you for hosting Office Hours. My pleasure. Thanks for being here. Who do you suggest for someone 
who is thinking of investment banking or private equity after considering leaving medical school. It's so funny you mentioned that because I just talked about Angela, Dr. Angela, um, leaving medical school and, and to, to become a teacher. That's interesting. Um, okay, so you're in medical school um, and you decided that you want to do investment banking or, or private equity. Yeah. So what I recommend doing is download for free my networking book. And you can go to haruneducation.com and, and download it. And it'll give you all the tricks and tips for free on how to make a career change by networking. Uh, your network is your net worth. Relationships are always more important than product knowledge. And so what I would do, and you can take my complete job course on Udemy as well, or join me in my MBA degree program so I can teach you how to make a much, much better version of a, of a LinkedIn profile or resume. Then what I would do is I would start networking with people uh, that focus on healthcare investment banking or healthcare private equity. And you need to learn a bunch about finance first before they'll take you uh, seriously. But given the fact that you have a, a medical background that will help you out tremendously. And I'll give you an example of a, of a guy I used to work with years ago uh, who's a doctor. Uh, I worked with him in the hedge fund industry. His name is David Farhadi. Brilliant man. Brilliant man. And because he was a doctor, he understood a lot of these healthcare investments better than most people. And so I worked at, at, at a great hedge fund, a um, couple of firms where he worked as well, Citadel and Pequot. Uh, but one of the reasons he got into that sector um, with a different background is because he tried to leverage himself as a content expert in, in one domain, healthcare, given his background. So what I recommend you do is go to uh, LinkedIn, make sure your LinkedIn profile is great. You can take my complete job course to make it awesome. But go to LinkedIn, read my networking book, and find people, you can do an advanced search, that are also uh, medical doctors like yourself that work in investment banking or in private equity. If they're out there, I promise you. Do an advanced search in LinkedIn, you'll find them. And if you can find somebody similar to you, meaning somebody that went to the same medical school as you, then when you reach out to them, um, it'll be easier for you to get a one-on-one -on -one meeting in person or using Zoom, etc., and you want to keep your in short. Less is more. You want to say, and I'll make this up, John, hope all is well. I'm also a graduate of uh, XYZ law, or Medical School. And I also live in New York or wherever you are. Please let me know if you have time for a coffee meeting uh, or, or, a, or, or a Zoom call. Thanks a lot. You don't say why you want to meet. And I'm not telling you to be you know, unethical or misleading. But if you tell people why you want to meet when you're networking using LinkedIn, they won't answer a lot of the time. Not because they don't want to help you, but because they feel bad. They're like, I don't know if I can help this person. But anyway, try that methodology out. I promise you it works. If it doesn't, let me know. And we'll work on plan B together live here every week on this webcast. Thank you. Okay. Next question is, hi, Chris. I hope you and your family are, are doing well. We're doing great, thanks. We're, do, we're doing great. And I've got um, Christine, my wife, and I got three. We celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary this week or this past week. It's amazing. Man. Dude, it goes by fast. Eh? And these are our, our, our three kids here and everyone's doing fine. Thank God we're, we're all healthy. We're happy. Um, but with Andrew, who's he's younger there, but he's 16 now, um, we work out together every day uh, in the garage. It, it's been fun. It's been fun. And if you can, get... Um, Get weights in your house if you can in your garage uh, and, and, and an exercise bike if you can. I've got a used elliptical trainer uh, because I, I think that when you have kids that are teenagers, if you exercise with them, well, they open up a bit more too because by the time your child is 12, you've already spent 90% of the time you'll ever spend with them. It's a true stat. It's amazing. Yeah. So we're, we're really bonding. And, and I feel I feel strongly about this, uh, getting a weight set at home if you can do it or an exercise bike or something because I, I find that if you lose, and it's totally off topic, but I'm always transparent. I find that if you lose your kids to drugs or other stuff when they're teenagers, they're, they could be done for life. Like when, when you think back of people from your high school years ago that were druggies, yeah, some of them can turn around, but some never do. So yeah, that's what I do. But I want to show, I want to go a little bit off script here. Uh, and I want to show you how I exercise, how I get my 15 to 20,000 steps a day in now, which I do. And I've actually lost about seven pounds 
over the past month or two doing this. I'll, I'll show you because I, I work insane hours, but the problem with me is I love doing what I'm doing. I love it. I don't have a job. I have a passion. Sometimes it's hard for me to push back. So what I'll do is I, I'm going to show you how I, how I exercise wh while I work. So I've got an exercise bike, um, a little one that's over there. It's called a desk cycle. I'll show you. But I want to show you also this how, how I get my steps in um, because I'm sitting right now on, on a treadmill. And this will be fun as well. So what I did was I, I bought for my team, all my employees, uh, a desk like this, a fully desk. And I bought it before COVID as well. Because a lot of them work from home. I want them to be happy. Um, and you can get this from fully.com, F-U-L-L-Y.com. And I'm not getting comped, as you know. But I'm going to show you the whole setup. So what I do is I put this aside. And I've got pedals. So I'm going to move these pedals. Um, and, and, and by the way, this is how I um, this is how I switch between screens. Let me, let me go back to... You won't be able to see me that well here. But, but I want to show you how I do it with my feet. So I've got five pedals. These are three and I got a, a couple others as well. So this one, and they're in order. Like that, that camera, this one... How you doing? This one, and then and then two others. But what I do is I step on these pedals here, and I'll show you how I do this 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 uh, this this setup here. So I hit power on, and this product here uh, that I'm walking on it's the cheapest treadmill you can get. There's no things on the side. It's called Fitbill F Walk. So just F I T B I L L. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll just I'll start it, and, and I'll show you. And this has helped me out a lot. A lot. Um, and again, uh, sorry about the microphone. But I'll work like this. Um, and I'll bring my... Um, everything is set up so it just works perfectly like this. And if you're curious about the clock behind me, that's because I do 20-minute one-on-ones this week. Every Thursday, actually, with my MBA degree students. Confidential one-on-ones. But what I do is I, I work like this. And, and I found that... Um, I found that I'm fresh first thing in the morning, just like all of you when you're studying. But I also find that in the afternoon when I'm starting to fade, I'll start walking on this. And what happens is I can work at the same time. It's not that hard, actually. Uh, but what happens is when you exercise like this, you're releasing endorphins, which makes you happier, serotonin, so you can think better. And you're also bringing oxygen into your brain so you can absorb more. I feel like a Hoover vacuum whenever I do this. And I do this several hours per day. And I get my steps in this way. And you don't even notice that you're doing it after a while. It, it's, it's amazing. It, it's great. It's great. Yeah. So let me just stop this here. And I'll show you how I put everything back. Go back here. And there's a special way to get the, the wheels perfect. Give me a second. There we go. Good. I sit back down here. And then I lower my desk and we're good to go. Yeah. If you treat this well, this works a lot better. Number 32 is where I go to. Good. Now I go back and click the right button here so I can get the right camera. Hey there. <laughs> All right. Great. I am a nerd. I get it. I just love all this technology stuff. It's, it, it's fun for me. Okay. So the question is, to be a good entrepreneur, networking is a very valuable skill. Uh, but are there any technical skills uh, in particular that we must focus on inculcating? I don't know what that word means. Good word, though. I like it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what skills do we need to focus on um, a technical skill wise to be a great entrepreneur. I, I would say that like things change pretty fast when it comes to um, social media. Um, like for my kids, I, I have three boys that are right behind me on, on this side here. Um, with, with my kids, their jobs and the way they communicate in the future has not been invented yet. And so I think that you always have to stay up to date on, on new tech trends. And the best way to do it is to observe your kids or your younger nep nephews or nieces or whatever it is, uh, just to see what technologies they're using because they are the future. You know, they grew up with YouTube. And now that they're, the younger generation is a bit older, that's what we're doing. You know, we're, we're, we're conducting business on, on, on YouTube. It's amazing. 
but had I not observed my kids um, years ago, consuming uh, social media, et cetera, I would not have started this. You, you need to observe the younger generation always, 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 because they kind of set the tone for business in the future. Yeah. So, and it's so interesting because the younger generation, they're, they're, they're far more positive than the older generation because they grew up with YouTube. And when I was a kid, my parents would watch 60 Minutes, for example, or CNN during Gulf War I, whatever it was. And when I would sit in the couch with them, because there's nothing else to do, um, there's no iPhones back then. But when I was sitting in the couch with them, there would be all this negativity coming from the media. And I'm not a conspiracy guy, but what's happened is... Look, if your kids are on the couch with you and you're watching TV, they're not watching TV. You might have a nice big TV at home. They don't watch it. They use their iPhones or Android handsets. And that's a good thing because a lot of the YouTubers they follow are these really go lucky, happy people. And they're good at marketing. And so your children watching YouTube, to a certain extent, without overdoing it, obviously, but your children watching YouTube, they're getting a digital marketing MBA by the time they're a teenager or 20 or whatever it is. Um, and the problem with traditional media is the media kind of gets it that they've lost an entire generation and their business model could be doomed if they don't adapt. And so nobody, not many people watch commercials anymore. And so the way to get all generations interested, unfortunately, in watching television news or going to news websites is to be extreme and always say the world is ending like chicken little. And I know I'm overdoing it here, but you know, sometimes the television will be on and a newscaster will say, fine, I'm going to make this up. Find out why the world's going to end after this commercial break. But when it comes to, uh, to, to, to the younger generation, they don't watch that stuff. They're much more positive. They're much more positive. You know, some of them even get their, their news on, on TikTok, uh, which I've been using a lot lately um, just to keep me sane in this ridiculous 2020 awful year. Um, just these go lucky, happy people use TikTok. And if you don't have TikTok on your phone, you got to download it right now. Stop this webcast immediately. Download TikTok because it'll, it'll crack you up. They're, they're little videos. Um, you, you'll enjoy it. You'll enjoy it. Yeah. All right, here we go. All right, next question is, is it okay to put Udemy qualifications in short course certificates on a curriculum vitae resume? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, people have been doing this forever. You know, even little certificates people got from Cisco or Microsoft Developers Network back in the 90s. They would put those little certificates uh, on the on in the education section on their resumes and LinkedIn profiles. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And, and the beauty with with online education is it provides high quality, affordable education on your own terms at a low low price. It's amazing. It's amazing. You know, I, I believe education, technology, and acceptance solve all problems in the world. Technology Education Acceptance, T-E-A-T, -E which is what my TEDx talk was about. So check that out if, if you want to. Uh, but no, there, there's, there's, I think it's fine to do that. I think it's a good thing. It can only help, especially on, on LinkedIn, because LinkedIn, the way it works is you have to think like a recruiter that's looking through your profile and tons of other profiles. They enter in certain skills, right? It's a search engine and they search for certain skills. If you take in skills or courses on Python or programming language or whatever it is, public speaking, um, and you put it on your, your LinkedIn profile, uh, then it's indexable. It can only help. It can only help. Yeah. yeah. And as Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon that we can use to change the world. All right. Uh, next up, Manchu. I, I love your your, your weekly um, icon you, you include there. It always cracks me up. Thank you. So Manchu is saying, hope you are doing well. Likewise, uh, when will your sales and marketing course on Udemy be out? I'm feeling curious. 
I'll be looking forward to seeing it uh, soon on the air. Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm partnering with a, a very large bank. I can't disclose who it is yet, but we're working on doing something along those lines. Um, so it, it will be out at some point this year. And you can also sign up for my MBA degree program. Um, you get the details from harooneducation.com and we cover that, all that stuff in much, much more detail. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, next question is, hi, Chris. Hey, I'm about to enter my last year of college and I want to spend it productively. What courses should I take and what should I do in general if my passion in life is entrepreneurship as well as building something and financial success? I've been advised to take data science and computer science courses. Should I do that or focus on things besides uh, academics? Yeah. So I, I, I think the best way to answer that question is to do a really basic gap analysis, which is this. Take some time today. Go for a walk by yourself and sit on a park bench and write down what is your perfect life in 10 years. Like every, perfect life. And, and don't be conservative, please. And once you write down what your perfect life is in 10 years from all aspects, then I want you to look at it and think to yourself, there's a gap. That's where I want to be. This is where I am now. How do I fill that gap? And if taking certain courses in school helps you, then do it. So for example, if you want to be an entrepreneur and start an online company, then having basic technology skills is important. You don't have to know everything, but just very basic ones. You know, maybe, maybe take a, a web development course. Maybe learn a little bit about, about JavaScript. Maybe learn about Python, learn how to make an app. Um, and I believe that Udemy does a better job than universities do um, because Udemy is always up to date. Universities are so old school, right? Their curriculums are from like last century, literally. So I would go to Udemy's website. I don't get comp for saying this ever. I just care. Go to Udemy's website, do a search for Angela Yu or Rob Percival and take their technology courses because you will learn more about technology uh, and, and how to start a company using technology products. You'll learn more there uh, from, from Udemy than you will from MIT uh, or you will from Stanford or you will from Harvard or Oxford or Cambridge, etc. Yeah. And, and make sure you do it. You don't do it for the money, like whatever you're thinking of doing 10 years from now, because if, if you focus, if your goals are just on, I don't know, how to, how to become insanely wealthy, you're, 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 you're never going to be happy. You're never going to be happy. You know, if you chase money, you'll lose your money and your dreams. If you chase your dreams, as long as you're willing to fail at least a couple of times, please fail at least a couple of times, then what happens is your dreams will come true over time and the money will follow accidentally. That's right. It always does. It always does. You just have to be willing to say, I don't give a damn what people think of me. This is my life. I'm living it in my own terms. And... I'm going to fail a lot, but I'm going to find myself by failing. And no one's ever reinvented the world or been successful in business without failing a lot first. And you only have to be right in business one time. Follow your heart. All right. Next question is, there have been scenarios where colleagues steal your idea to get ahead of you. There are also some cases where your boss may be biased. How would you deal with this? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sorry you're going through this. I've gone through this as well. Sometimes when you get a job, if you're so good at what you do, your boss feels threatened and your boss thinks, goodness, I think I hired my assassin. Not because you're a shark, you're not, but because your boss is insecure. That's right. Now, it's tough. It's tough because there's kind of a glass ceiling, so to speak, on your career because your boss feels threatened by you. And if you're feeling frustrated like that, I say, good. I say it with love my heart because with frustration comes breakthrough. You know, what was the reason you were put on this earth? What's your passion? Why are, why are there glass ceilings you're, you're hitting? What, what's, what's happening? You're, you're frustrated. And it happened to me many times. And I'm glad it did in hindsight. I didn't understand it at the time, but now I'm, I'm grateful to God it did. 
I'm grateful because it forced me to get outside my comfort zone and say, screw this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm not a tree I can move, as Meryl Streep said. And I started my own companies. Or I went to work at other companies to make more or just be happier, that sort of thing. And I look back at some of my bosses, not all of them, some of them, and they're, they're kind of like those dudes that peaked in high school. You know what I'm talking about. Somebody who kind of felt important in high school, but it's nothing in life now. And I, I hope this happens to you. And again, I say it with love in my heart. I hope it happens because it'll force you to get outside your comfort zone, start your own company, and live your life on your own terms. And if I could humbly help you do that, please let me know. And that's the crux and reason why I do what I do. You know, I, I, I kind of want to, I don't want to give anybody a fish. I want to teach people how to fish so they can humbly live their lives in their own terms. So check out my MBA degree program. Um, as I do whatever it takes to make you successful from a business perspective and many other perspectives in your life too. And there's a 30-day 100% money back guarantee. But don't worry. Don't worry if, if, if your boss is a schmuck because in the long run, you're going to look back and you're going to be so grateful that your boss was like that because that created a pivot or a turning point for you professionally from a career perspective to start your own company or to find a better job. There'll be a plateau for your boss in terms of how much they progress. Um, if, if, if they're insecure, they'll, they'll never make it to the top. So anyway, yeah, it, it's, it's complicated working in, in companies for other people. There's a lot of wonderful companies. I've worked for a lot of wonderful people, but I've worked for people that should not be managing people either. And the silver lining or positive thing is that I learned when I was being mismanaged, I learned how not to manage people. That was a good lesson. It was a good lesson. And, you know, I, I remember having frustrations at, at business years ago and thinking to myself, I don't understand. You know, and I would pray as well. And I thought, God, I don't get it. I, I do everything I'm supposed to do. Why is it, things not working out? And I remember talking to my dad as well about it. I was like, Dad, I don't get it. I just got let go. But I made the firm a lot of money. I get along with everybody. I just don't get it. Am I a threat to my, what is happening? This is so unfair. And then my dad told me to read um, the book of Job in the Old Testament. Uh, I won't get all religious on you, but well, actually I will a bit. Job, it, it, J-O-B, Job. But there's this dude who lost a lot of stuff professionally and then later on became really successful. And in hindsight, he was grateful to God that he had these setbacks Right. Perception becomes reality. It depends how you see it. You know, for me in business, um, I, I don't worry. Like I used to worry a lot, um, but I got to a point in my life, even when I wasn't successful, where I told myself, God already knows what's going to happen. And that should put me at ease. Everything happens for a reason. And frustration in work can be a beautiful thing for you, longer term, longer term. Um, you'll look back and say, I I'm glad that person was a schmuck to me. So I remember I worked at Accenture, Accenture, Accenture years ago. It's actually a great company. Um, and by the way, don't ever, I humbly don't suggest you work in consulting when you have kids because you want to be there for your kids. But it's a great place to start a career. But I remember I worked and, and, and I was, it was, God, it was late 2000, late 1995. I'm an old man. And I was working in Toronto at Accenture on the merger of Manulife Financial and Confederation Life. And it was 10 p.m. one night. And this one associate partner from the Orange County office who was in town managing the project, I'll never mention his name. But he asked me, he said, um, hey, you, can you, can you, print out this report from a database. It was 10 p.m. And I said, no problem. I had no idea how to do it. And I tried hard, really, really hard. And I was nervous I was going to mess up the fields and corrupt the database. I kept trying. And I went up to him, you know, maybe around 11 o'clock that night. And I said, I'm so sorry. I've tried. I just can't, I can't figure it out. And he looked at me and he said, it's because you're incompetent. And then he turned and walked away. And I was standing there at the time, and I remember I was watching with, with my girlfriend then Melrose Place, and there was a mean company with Heather, 
Locklear, I think her name is, called D&D Advertising. I thought, oh my God, is this D&D Advertising? I'm working, this is terrible. And I was so fed up and so frustrated. And of course, I kept my cool. Right? I had my, my, my Lady Gaga poker face on. <laughs> and I was frustrated. And, and I'm glad it happened because it forced me, it planted the seed, the mustard seed within me, so to speak, to say, screw it. I'm just going to start my own company one day. You know, I'll work for others and I'll learn what not to do and what to do as well. But my end goal is going to be to start my own company so that, and I'm going to swear here, I'm so sorry, I rarely do this, but earmuffs. There's nothing worse than spending the rest of your life being someone else's bitch. And there's nothing worse than waking up one day when you're older and thinking, I hate my job because I work for this jerk that pays me this much money to make their dreams become a reality. Frustration's a good thing because it will plant that seed to get you to start your own company or change careers or get a better job. So with crisis comes opportunity. It's all based on perception, how you see it. It is. You know, is the glass half full or is it half empty? Perception becomes reality. I don't think it's half full or half empty ever. My cup overfloweth with optimism all the time. Positive attitude can really, really help you in these difficult corporate moments. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It's hard though, man. Like I, I gotta tell you, it, it's tough working for somebody that feels threatened by you. And I hate corporate politics, but when your boss is not around, if you're going to get let go anyway, because your boss feels threatened by you, when your boss is not around, I want you to go to his or her boss and just impress them somehow with a report or something. You got nothing to lose and everything's a gain. All right, next question is, uh, sir, no, call me Chris, please. If you are advising someone between 20 and 30 and 30 and 40, what should... Uh, they concentrate on. Yeah. So I would say regardless of your age, I want you to always write down goals every year. Write them down because the probability of them coming true goes up materially if you write them down. And also set a deadline date. And the reason why most people give up in their New Year's resolutions by the third week of January is because they didn't set a deadline date. In addition to setting a deadline date, I want you to vocalize your goals as well. Tell your, your friends, your, 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 your loved ones about your goals and your deadline date because that will put pressure on you, and I say it with love in my heart, to make them come true. What I would also say is, in terms of what you should concentrate on per your question, just focus on making yourself happy by doing what you want to do with your career. You know, don't become a lawyer because mom and dad wanted you to. Otherwise, you'll never be, ha you'll never be happy because you'll be living your, ter their li your life on, on their terms, which sucks. So just do what you want to do. Do what makes you happy. And I promise you, you'll be incredibly successful in the long run. You do you. You be you. You know, as Dr. Seuss said, because those that mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind. Just be yourself yourself and, and focus on what you're happy doing in life. Don't focus on trying to, you know, uh, impress other people. Who cares? I mean, some, as, as Les Brown said, somebody else's uh, opinion of you days in your life are number one, the day you're born, and number two, the day you find out why. What's your why? What are you here for? How can you make this world a better place by the time you leave it? What do you love doing? What would you do with your time if you weren't working and you couldn't travel and you couldn't go to school? What would you do with your time? That is what you should be doing full time. No matter what anybody tells you, chase your dreams and get everybody out of your life that brings you down. There's no room for them in your life. Why would you hang out with somebody that's negative, that's bringing you down? You can cut them off. It's easy. When I was younger, 
you know, it was basically 10 strikes, you're out, or five strikes, you're out, out in Canada. And then I got older, and I realized that if I hang out with people that are going to be negative, I'm never going to reach my full potential in life. I cut them off, and so can you. All right. All right, give me one second, guys. I'm going to scroll down and just do an audio and video check, see if there's any complaints. Hold on a second. Good. All right. Good. No one's complaining, which means things are working. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Um, next up is you probably haven't heard of, do you um, know the continent called uh, Lemuria, where they say humans uh, originated from? Um, Lemuria. I'll have to do it on this computer over here. All right. Hi, Angela. Lemuria. Lemuria continent. All right. Lemuria is a hypothetical lost land located in either India or the Pacific Ocean. Now discredited scientific theory. The theory was adopted by some word I don't know <laughs> at the time. Incorporated. Okay. A lost continent. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I, I don't know anything about this. I'm, I'm so sorry. But but I learn when, when, when I get these, these wonderful questions from my students. Thank you. All right. Um, next question is, sir, uh, none of my questions uh, were answered uh, last time. Uh, and I came when the stream started. Yeah. So um, what happens is this. Like a lot of people will start submitting questions um, eight or nine hours before the call starts. But what YouTube does um, with YouTube Live is they only allow questions that were posted within, say, two or so hours before the call. So if you want to post questions before uh, the call starts, just do it with, within two hours uh, if you can, please. Thanks. It is hot in here, man. That's a problem with having all these lights here. It gets, it gets real hot. But I love it. I don't have a job. I have a passion. All right. Uh, next question is from Shubham. Hey, man, how are you? Uh, I wanted to get your opinion on which industry you think will be disrupted uh, in the coming future. Yeah, so I would just think of any sector or job function that has not yet been disrupted, um, you know, similar to what Uber or, or, or Lyft have done to the taxi industry. Uh, and, and the sectors that haven't really been as disrupted are, are the ones where there's been a lot of government regulation. Um, so healthcare and financial services. I think we're going to see a lot of deregulation in those two sectors for, for obvious reasons. Healthcare, because of COVID, for example, I, I think that you're going to be able to get it. Uh, and I really do believe that uh, life extension is going to be one of the biggest areas that venture capital firms are going to continue uh, to invest in. I, I see it right here in the Bay Area. It's happening. It's happening. Um, and also from, so I think that governments are going to loosen the rules when it comes to regulatory approval of, of certain products that can help save the human race um, from, from certain viruses, et cetera. Another area I think is going to do exceptionally well is financial services uh, when it comes to disruption. Um, and, and the reason is that, you know, countries have had monopolies with the only currency they have in each country for century currencies as well. So the bottom line is I think we're going to see a lot of disruption uh, in, in fintech, financial service technology, as well as healthcare. All right. Okay, question is, I've heard by many professionals that online courses do not increase your credibility when it comes to adding to your chances of getting a job. Yeah. So what I would say is education is dramatically changing. It's changing fast. And the problem with education now is the system is rigged to a certain extent. Not every university, but a lot of them. And what's incredibly unfair is that based on your zip code or where you grew up or whether or not your parents have money, it will determine whether or not you can get into certain schools. And a lot of times you'll, you'll meet people that went to certain elite schools. And after getting to know them for a while, after a while, you're like, I don't get it. How did this person get into that school? You know, they're no, no better than I am. And a lot of times it's because of legacy. Their parents went there. 
or their parents donate a lot of money. The system is rigged and I want to humbly do what I can to help. I want to make education. Um, can't get the same access to education that somebody that was born with a silver spoon in their mouth that went to Oxford or Cambridge because their parents went there, for example, or USC. You know, we, we, we've all seen the, the reports on people lying on their applications uh, and very wealthy parents will hire people to get their kids into these schools and lie. And the problem is that we've only heard of a handful of these situations, but I promise you it happens all the time. Why is it that somebody who's very rich or very um, successful, why is it their kids get in these great schools? Why? Are their kids born just as, as brilliant or hardworking? No. I believe there's a lot of unethical activity happening that we just don't know about. And so a lot of people get in these great schools because their parents have money or because their parents have connections. That's not fair. I gave a TEDx talk years ago where I talked about how tea can fix all problems in the world. TEA, technology, education, and acceptance. I think if everybody had equal access to education and there was no you know, elitism occurring within the educational sector, that we wouldn't have the problems we have in the world today. You know, we, we all have the, the right to food, air, water, freedom of religion. Why can't we all get the right access to education? We can. We can at an affordable price online. And so what I think is going to happen uh, with universities, my long-term vision, I think this is going to happen. I think the top 50 or so universities in the world will be harder to get into, you know. Um, but I think that the mid-tier and lower-tier ones that, that still cost 100 k to go to a year or whatever, I think you're going to go bankrupt. I think hundreds of them are going to go bankrupt universities. Why? Because it doesn't make sense to spend $100,000 on a four-year education where in many cases you don't learn valuable skills you can use immediately in the world. And there's only 13 hours of class a week in many undergraduate schools. It's ridiculous. It really is. And a lot of people get into these schools also because of elitism. And again, I think a lot of these schools are going to go belly up. You know, at first... The endowment will save them for a couple of years. And then after a few more years, they're running at multi-billion dollar deficits. They'll call the alumni and the alumni will try to save them, which will extend it for another year or two. Then they'll go belly up. You don't need to go to a top university to change the world. There's so many people that don't have any university degrees that have changed the world. And you can do it too. In fact... You don't need a university degree anymore to get a job at Google, Apple, Facebook, Wells Fargo, IBM, and many, many other schools, okay? Or other, other companies. You don't. You don't. Um, so I think the age of educational elitism are behind us or soon will be. And I believe you're only as good as your last, your last game. I do. And, and, and your net worth is based on your network. Uh, and so you can read my book here on networking for free. Go to my website, haruneducation.com, download it for free. Because I promise you the stuff I teach in that, that book, humbly, will help you much more to become successful in business than having some university bless you because you have an MBA. What, what does MBA stand for? Married but available? <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Uh, I education I do. But what I don't respect is people getting in to certain schools because of their parents. It's, it's not fair. It's not fair. And I really do believe that every problem in the world can be fixed with education. And I think what's going to happen is you're going to have teachers all over the world that are going to rise up and change society from within. So rather than America, for example, sending troops overseas or any country sending troops overseas to win wars they can't win or understand i think each society changes from within like a million malalas rising up and teaching online on udemy or youtube 
or wherever. They change the world from within. I, I really believe it can happen, and it will. Next question is, what do you think is the biggest gap between employers and educators today? I mean, what is it that the industry demands, which educational institutes are not fulfilling? Yeah. So universities, a lot of the time, they teach stuff that was relevant last century, literally. Literally. Now, healthcare is a different matter. If you got a med, a school, a med school degree, that, that's great. That's awesome. You can't become a doctor without one. I get it. But do I really need to learn about supply and demand graphs? Like when I'm studying business, like does anybody use that in the real world? Maybe if you're an economist, which is 0.00001% of MBA graduates. I, I believe that stuff that's told us in school is antiquated and it doesn't help us improve our lives. You know, a lot of people graduate with a university degree and they graduate not knowing how to file taxes. They graduate not knowing how to manage their own money. You know, business schools teach you how to manage other people's money, not your own. I remember when I graduated from business school years ago, myself and all my friends, we wanted to buy eventually houses or, or an apartment. And we called each other and you're like, how's the mortgage work? You're like, I don't know, man. We, we learned how to manage other people's money. So we all call mom, mom, dad, how's the mortgage work? Universities don't teach you how to get a job. They don't teach you how to present with passion from the heart. They don't teach you how to sell. They don't teach how to network. Uh, these are basic life skills. We need to, why do we go to university? So we can be independent and learn stuff. We're not independent and in learning the right stuff. And so I really do believe that my vision of the future is if people are going to do undergraduate degrees at university, it's going to be two years, not four. And it will be supplemented with, with online courses from everybody. You know, and, and the beauty about learning online is you learn from people that have done it and you don't learn about BS theory. You learn about stuff you can apply right away. And it's, it's like educational Darwinism online when it comes to teaching. Those that add value to your life fast enough, kind of like YouTube uh, vloggers, are going to get a um, you know, larger share of the pie, so to speak. And everybody can teach. Everybody can teach. Everybody can. You all have skills to teach. You know, on Udemy, for example, there's this, this guy named uh, Ninja. My kids love him. He used to teach them how to use Fortnite and Twitch. But he started out his career teaching online. On Udemy, actually, how to use Twitch. There, there's amazing stories of people that have taken their passion and start teaching online and monetizing it and improving people's lives. You know, people that teach how to bake bread. It's true. Look up Teresa Greenway's courses. They're Awesome. People that teach you how to how to code, you know, from people that don't have degrees in how to code, like Angela Yu. You know, she's a she's a doctor, a medical doctor, but she teaches how to code. She just loves it. You know, I, I, I don't think that you have to have degrees from the best schools uh, in order to be extraordinarily successful. In fact, I think what happens is there's kind of an entitlement that sets in for a lot of people that graduate from these great schools and they're not as motivated. I want somebody that's poor, smart, and hungry, and from a difficult background, meaning uh, they don't have the best set of cards or never did from a financial perspective. Those are the people I like to partner with and hire because those people will work much harder because there's less entitlement there. So the bottom line is I think this educational elitism will come to an end within the next few decades. I think you can learn online and do it at a much cheaper cost, obviously, and jumpstart your career immediately without barriers. There's no more limits anymore in terms of where you can find education or the price even. Next question is, what performance do I need to accomplish to get a job as a trader in New York? Uh, I'm from Romania. My portfolio is up 30% so far uh, this current month. Yeah. So I think if you want to be, and by the way, I, I wouldn't, I, I, I humbly don't believe in trading because when, when you trade, like you try to make money each month and each month has 20 trading days, right? 20 weekdays. 
So 20 days, the markets are open. And stocks can go up or down for things that are outside of your control. You end up getting fooled by randomness. They can go up or down based on fiscal policy, monetary policy, geopolitical events, a company reporting earnings, um, some sort of publication on how the health crisis may improve, et cetera. I think you got to be long-term focused. And, and I say this with love in my heart, but I challenge you, all of us, myself included, to come up with a name of a trader who's made money for decades. That person doesn't exist. The best investors are long-term focused. The Warren Buffetts of the world. The longer the view, the wiser the intention, to quote Warren Buffett. Now, in terms of how do you get a job um, in New York from Romania, I would network like crazy. You, you can do it. You can do it. Um, I remember there was, a, there was a woman from Romania that worked for us at Goldman. Her name is uh, Reluca Gold. And she, she networked um, from Romania, came to the States. Uh, she started as an assistant, and then she, she actually became a trader. She's on well. She's, she's nice, too. Yeah. Uh, but but networking is key. And she's great at networking. And you can be great as well. Net, your network, your net worth is your network. Read my book. It's free. Okay, It's a networking book you can get from haruneducation.com. I guarantee you, I promise you, it will help you get that coveted job if you apply the principles I teach in that free book. Or you can take my complete job course on Udemy, uh, which is the only course I have that has a lifetime money back guarantee. Okay. You can take it for 10 bucks or whatever it is, the complete job course. And if it doesn't work for you, you got a lifetime guarantee. You got nothing to lose and everything to gain. That's how strongly I feel about my methodology when it comes to networking and selling yourself. Yeah. Uh, next question is uh, Shubham, who's saying, uh, thank you for answering, Chris. I absolutely enjoy your courses and knowledge that you share with us so, so selflessly. Um, thank you for making my Thursday better. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. And thank you for making my Thursday better. All of you. Uh, this, this is fun for me. I, I don't have a job. I, I have a passion. Yeah. All right. And I'm so sorry about that. The technical issues uh, we, we had this morning, um, which thank goodness I, I resolved. Yeah. Um, but I make mistakes. All right. Next one is... Uh, Army Gaming uh, is saying hi. How are you? And Paul uh, Papadopoulos is saying hi, Chris. Dude, I, I knew a guy uh, I went to high school with, a couple years older than me, uh, named Paul uh, Papadopoulos as well, in, in Oakville, Ontario, Canada. And he, he was a great swimmer. I remember that. Nice guy. So if that's you, how are you? If not, great to have you as well. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Dupree, present. Andrew is just like me, except he's the opposite. He's an American that lives in Canada. I'm a Canadian that lives in America. And he's, uh, he was actually the first student to get accepted uh, to my MBA degree program. And Andrew is wonderful. And thank you, Andrew. Andrew actually was the first person, along with Jason, one of my other great students, to tell me about COVID as well, um, which, which could have saved me healthcare-wise. So thank you for that. Always great to have you, buddy. Dario, how are you? Uh, Dario saying, hey, Chris, I just wanted to say hi. Uh, thank you for everything. P.S. Your course is on Udemy Rock. Thank you, Dario. Great, great to have you. Great to have you. I went to school, actually, um, with a guy named Dario from, um, he went to IMD, I think undergrad. Yeah, great guy. Yeah. And we used to always say, and he loved he loved Mario. Um, it was a, around the time of Mario 64, and he used to say, it's me, Dario. I loved it. Great to have you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Manas, how are you? Manas in the house. Uh, and then Mahadur is saying, uh, suppose I own one share of uh, Linde, uh, Bangladesh Limited. After on their annual um, general meeting, if they decide to give a 500% dividend uh, in percent, um, how much will I earn for that one share as a dividend? Yeah. That, 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 okay. In that hypothetical example. So what would that would mean hypothetically is if you have one share in a company and it's worth a dollar and you get um, a 3% dividend, okay, one year, that means you get three pennies. If you get a 100% dividend, that means you get a dollar. If you get a 500% dividend, that means you get $5, 
It would never, it never happen. Never happen. Yeah. But what happens sometimes is when companies do massive one-time special dividends because they're, their investors kind of pressure them to do something with the cash. This happened with Microsoft uh, in, in the fall of 2003, I think it was. Microsoft offered a special one-time 10% dividend. They had a lot of cash and investors were pissed. They're like, why aren't you giving us this money? And Bill Gates would always say, at Microsoft, we're always one and a half years away from bankruptcy. And having that mentality made him successful because as Andy Grove said, only the paranoid survive. Now, obviously, Microsoft's never one and a half years away from bankruptcy, but that's when Bill Gates ran the company, you know, in the 70s, 80s, 90s. That's what he thought. But what happened was um, Microsoft issued a one-time 10% dividend. It was the fall of 2003. I remember I worked at a hedge fund then, uh, and we invested. And what happened was, because it was one time, Microsoft stock went up before it, and when the dividend was paid out, and usually dividends are announced and it takes a day or two for it to hit your account, when it goes X dividend, it drops 10%, right? Because the market is somewhat efficient with these things. The will of D in the house. He's saying, yo, 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 missed you, man. Every time I see you, I, I take a sip of water because, and the will of D is from Morocco. He's awesome. He's an online teacher as well and, and a great entrepreneur. But um, it was like a year and a half ago, you kept telling me to drink water because I kept, I, I forget. Yeah, yeah. Which, yeah. Mm. I remember that. And you wrote here, <laughs> you wrote, I hope you're doing well. And you wrote here, the water reminder. I don't forget. Thank you. Yeah. And the Will of D is writing, so Chris, I'm still working on an educational platform, which will be concentrated in the local market. Shall I do the mobile app too? Yeah. So I would, um, it's tough. Like rather than reinventing the wheel, it just depends on what you're doing. Like if you're teaching a course online, it makes sense to put your course on, on Udemy. Because Udemy is like Google and everyone else is Bing in ed tech, meaning they'll distribute your product. But if you want to do it on your own website, um, what I've done is I use Teachable. And if you go to teachable.com, it's just a, an e-commerce engine where you can upload your courses to and you pay a licensing fee. Um, now, instead of me recreating an educational platform from scratch, it didn't make sense for me to do that. Um, so what I did was I used Teachable. So I recommend using Teachable. And they also have a mobile app. Um, which it works on iPhone. I think they're kind of working on an Android version right now. Um, but anyway, that, that's what you can do. And people can even watch uh, the videos you make if you put them on Teachable. They can watch it on a desktop, laptop, tablet, and an iPhone or Android handset as well. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, how many courses should I produce monthly? I, I would focus on, like, less is more. Like the people that do really well online are the ones that sell um, comprehensive courses, but they don't release an insane number of them. Like there are some people that, that have hundreds of courses. It just doesn't work. Um, and I used to be that way as well. You know, I had, a more, I had more than 50 courses on Udemy and I just took uh, 20 of them down. And the reason I did is because it was dragging down my ratings and because they weren't the highest quality, right? It's just, it's, it's, it's not fair for me to sell a product that's not the best quality. So I took them down and I'm making new ones that are going to be higher quality uh, as well. Uh, and so the, the, the teachers that do exceptionally well don't have a gazillion courses, you know, au contraire. They have fewer than the ones that don't do as well to have many courses. You know, it, it, it's, it's the quality, not the quantity that matters uh, when you're making online courses. Yeah. And if you want a good case study on this, just do a search for Angela Yu uh, in Udemy. She, she has great courses that are all high quality. She doesn't have a gazillion courses. She doesn't need to. She's awesome with what she does with, with fewer courses. That's the right strategy. All right, next next question is, um, oh, it's a comment from uh, Raghav who's saying, uh, hey, Chris, I, I love the way uh, of, of you teach online. The Complete Finance Analyst course helped me a lot. Awesome, thank you. Appreciate that. I had fun with that. I created a fictitious company called, what was it called again? Morgan Haroon Sachs, MHS. Yeah. Um, which is a country, uh, a company that has an investment bank that has a not so rich history since 2017, I think. Yeah, it's a pretend company. Okay. All right, next up is, Matt asked is saying, God will help you. Thank you. And this is regarding earlier when I was trying to, trying to get the, uh, the webcast up and running. I had an issue with, with YouTube, but 
I always have a back door. Back for fifty dollars per share. After seven years, uh, the face value is is only ten dollars per share. How and why? Yeah. So okay, the question is: There's a company that went public at one hundred fifty bucks seven years ago. Now it's only ten bucks. Why? So there, there are, the main reason companies go down is because the amount of money that people think they can make goes down a lot. Okay. Um, so for example, and people always focus on the future earnings, not, not the present earnings. So for example, Research in Motion, ticker RIM, uh, on the TSX Toronto Stock Exchange, uh, as well as, uh, as, as in New York, or actually NASDAQ, RIMM, um, they were doing exceptionally well. And they kind of, their business model got crushed once Apple released um, uh, released the iPhone in in, in 07, uh, and the same thing with um, with with Google with, with Android. You know their, their their business fell off a cliff, uh, and so a lot of investors, rightly so, forecasted that research in motion would not make as much money, and so their stock dropped a lot, a lot. Um, so anyway, that that's the, the fundamentals of that company you're referring to, whatever it is, uh, probably got a hell of a lot worse than when they went public. Maybe a competitor came in and is taking a lot of share. Maybe something else happened. But it all comes down to earnings. If, uh, if professional money managers forecast that earnings a company is going to make in the future, because that's how you value companies based on future earnings, if they forecast that earnings aren't going to grow as much or they'll decrease, then the stock gets absolutely crushed. And it might have been overhyped to that stock. You'd have to tell me the stock name. I can provide you with my, my humble thoughts on, on what happened. You know, maybe it wasn't that liquid. Um, who knows? Great quote from Manas is saying, the man who never made a mistake never learned something new. Albert Einstein. I love it. Yes. All right. And Tyler uh, Shelby uh, is saying, I'm stealing uh, this question from Tim Ferriss. What is a book or books that you gift to people or a gift to someone? Yeah. So I, I would say that the, the best book, um, not written by me, none of my books are good, but the best book is by Dale Carnegie. I've got it here. This is an oldie, but this is a, a, a goodie as well. So this here is called um, How to Win Friends uh, and Influence People. Uh, and it was uh, written by Dale Carnegie back in the 1930s. It's, it's an oldie. It's got a lot of old metaphors in it. Uh, but human nature and relationships haven't really changed since that 1930s. So I recommend you read this book. Again, it's called How to Win Friends uh, and Influence People uh, by Dale Carnegie. Uh, and he talks about how people are, are creatures of emotion in business and not creatures of logic a lot of the times, and, and just how to talk to people as well, uh, and how to get somebody who disagrees with you uh, to see your perspective and, and maybe agree with you, how to listen better, that sort of thing. It's really basic. I love it. Um, if you don't want to read it, if you're too busy, get the Audible version as well. Um, I subscribe to audible.com. I don't get comp from anybody ever. I'm never sponsored. I get sponsorship inbounds uh, all the time. I never respond. But go to audible.com subscribe. It's like 15 bucks a month or whatever it is. And you get a, several books uh, and an investment in education in yourself uh, pays the best dividends to quote Benjamin Franklin. But get this book here and listen to it as well. It, it's life changing. It, it's amazing. And you'll love it. And without this book, a, a lot of these amazing self-help people um, that have these programs online and in person wouldn't be as successful today without the grandfather of, of self-help, so to speak. And this stuff applies to personal relationships and to business a lot as well, because as we know, business is about your network and your network is your net worth and relationships are always more important than product knowledge. Please read this book. All right. All right, next question is, I recently started investing in the equity markets, meaning the stock markets, yeah. And my first investment was a big mistake, which gave me this lesson. And then you wrote here, and I guess I have to scroll down. I don't see this lesson. Yeah, I'm scrolling down. I, I, don't, I don't see the lesson, I'm sorry. Um, maybe you want to paste it again. A lot of times when, when you paste it, when you put it in a link, um, you can't actually see the, uh, 
YouTube blocks it. So paste it again if you want to. Or if I overlooked it, I'm sorry. All right. Um, next question is, what do you think about the phrase, cash is trash, from uh, Ray Daglio? You were here. Okay. So I, I think, um, maybe it's Ray, Ray Dalio. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, who, who started a, a big hedge fund on the East Coast. Um, so I agree. You know, cash is the worst investment you can possibly make because governments can print more of it, diluting your net worth. Yeah, cash is trash. I agree with that. I've never heard that before. I love it. Absolutely. I love it. And with governments create, printing so much money these days and interest rates basically being zero, you're not getting any return on your cash. And so rather than do that, you might as well invest in other asset classes like stocks, commodities, bonds, real estate, etc. Yeah. The problem with cash is that, again, governments can print an unlimited amount, which can really destroy your net. Like the reason that the Roman Empire crumbling uh, from Jerusalem that actually has Pontius Pilate on one side of it from the year 30 AD. And you're like, oh my God, Chris, that must be worth a fortune. No, it's worth next to nothing because they made so many of those coins. That's why the Roman Empire you know, crumbled. And governments do this over and over and over again, and we never learn. It happened in Germany with the Deutschmark, which was such a horrific uh, point of hyperinflation back, I think it was 20s, 1920s or so, yeah, after World War I. They printed a lot of money. And people had to literally show up with wheelbarrows full of Deutschmarks in the market to buy a loaf of bread. Deutschmark was the old uh, German currency way before the euro. The same thing happened in Zimbabwe. You know, in, in the fall of 2008, when we were all within 24 hours of bank machines not working, uh, the government of Zimbabwe printed a lot more money. And the daily inflation rate, half as much, it, it, was, it was brutal. Uh, and so because company, countries can print an unlimited amount of currency, I do believe, and I agree with that statement, that cash is trash. All right. All right. And give me, um, give me one second, guys. I, I want to do just a, a quick little spot check here. Okay. Um, so humor me here. I, I want to check my internet speed. Um, I can see it's yellow here, which is not great, but I just want to check to see if it's um, a broader issue here. So let's go here to how fast is my internet? All I care about is the upload speed, which should be at least six or seven megs per second. I don't care about download. Okay. So download, I, I don't care about download. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's a terabyte or 10 gig. All I care about is the upload because I'm uploading video, this streaming webcast. Okay, we're good. We're good. That's, yeah. And to do 4K, um, which you can't do on YouTube yet for streaming, you got to be at least 20 or so megs per second. We're, we're, we're good. We're good. All right. Thanks for your patience there. All right. Next question is from Amin, who's saying, hi, Chris, since purchasing a property by a mortgage is full of hassles because of repairs, costs, et cetera, finding tenants. Would you say buying REITs is a better option for a busy person? Yeah, that's a great question. So for those of you not familiar with REITs, REITs stands for Real Estate Investment Trust. And it's kind of like a stock because it has a ticker as well. And the government rule is that if you want other people to invest in your property and you want to list on the stock market through a REIT, the law is that 90% of the earnings for that real estate company has to be paid out in dividends. And that's why REITs usually have really, really high dividend yields. Uh, it's also, a lot of REITs are very liquid as well, meaning you can sell them immediately because they trade a lot. Uh, unlike traditional real estate where it's not liquid. Great, but any investment you should receive and ask if you don't get it, you should receive a prospectus. So you can read about the pros and the cons, the risk, et cetera. Uh, with that investment class. Do the same with a REIT, please. Thanks. <clears throat> Amazing Science 360 is saying, uh, hi, Chris, who's your idol in, in business uh, and entrepreneurship? Yeah, well, my dad's first, of course. Uh, aside from, from my dad, who's like a father to me. I love you, dad, if you're watching. Um, probably Bill Gates. 
um, I mean, not only did he start Microsoft today with his wonderful wife, uh, Melinda, you know, the Gates Foundation. Um, and, and I think if we're going to find a cure for this awful COVID crisis, I think Bill Gates is probably going to be a part of it. So he, he's, a, he's a hero to me. And I read every single book of his when I was younger, like in the early 90s. I read every book of his. I, I, I love that guy. Love that guy. Yeah, he's amazing. He's amazing. So anyway, that's, that's my, my, my business idol, so to speak. And I want you all to turn your business idol into your rival one day. Hey, Joao, how are you? Alex is saying, do you have any advice for someone starting uh, at a student accelerator at all? Start if you can. Um, you know, failing to plan is planning to fail. And go to my website, harooneducation.com. And on one of the pages there, you can find a link to take my, my business plan course. Uh, on, on, on Udemy or elsewhere. So I would write a business plan first if you can. Uh, and there's a 30-day 100% money back guarantee in the course, I think is 10 bucks. It's a good deal. It's nine hours long. You can even take it and then get a refund. Yeah. And Paul is writing, uh, I'm about to start prepping my first course on Udemy. Um, what's the biggest pitfall to, to avoid? Yeah. So I would... Don't record it until you get feedback from Udemy telling you on the, the help section on their website, it'll tell you how. But you can upload a small portion of a video and they'll tell you if the audio and video is good enough or not. And they'll help you out with it as well. Uh, and what I recommend doing actually is because I've, I've made every mistake you can possibly make teaching online. So um, what you can do is I released a couple courses uh, on how to teach online. And it's based on mistakes I've made. I'm very self-deprecating. So you can work smarter and, and not harder uh, making your courses. And so I released one course called 40 Tips on how to make a great online course based on 40 mistakes I've made. And I released another one called Another 40 Tips on making a great online course based on another 40 tips I, I've made. It's free. Um, and again, it'll help you work smarter and not harder and not make the same many mistakes that, that I've made uh, teaching online. So, so check it out. I've also made it available in, in a bunch of other languages as well because I humbly believe that education can fix every problem in the world. And as always, I respect you. Thanks. Appreciate that. Yeah. So I cannot provide you with a fish, so to speak. And so if you take my any of my courses, please, like don't ever watch an interview with somebody on TV and then buy a stock based on that because that person being interviewed, my complete finance course on, on Udemy, uh, to learn how to do that or sign up for my MBA degree program, which has a 30 day, 199, 30 day, 100% money back guarantee. And I teach you much, 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 much more about how to pick stocks and do investment research. Yeah. And this week in my MBA uh, degree program, we're actually doing a case study on Microsoft's hostile acquis acquisition attempt uh, on Intuit. Uh, as well as invest, how to do investment research on Intuit, which is the parent company, ticker INTU, that owns uh, Quicken, QuickBooks, TurboTax, Mint.com, et cetera. All right. All right, next question is from Darshid, who's saying, hello, Chris. I, I want to ask, uh, as an ACCA, should I do a course on data analytics, machine learning, or artificial intelligence? ACCA stands for it. Association of Chartered Certified Accountants. It's like a CPA. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to think if that makes sense for you. I think to the extent that you, you can understand how to analyze data um, better than your competitors can in the accounting sector, from a CPA perspective, it might make sense. Um, you know, maybe you can learn how to use tools like Tableau, which is owned now by uh, Salesforce or other business analytics products, like Oracle owns uh, Hyperion, which is business analytics product. Uh, IBM owns Cognos. Um, you've got SAP owns business objects and crystal reports. So maybe you can learn about some of those reporting uh, and data analysis type products um, to help with your reporting and analysis of data that you can report to your customers being a CPA. That might be helpful. Uh, and I would just do a search on Udemy for a guy named Kirill because he teaches great courses based on that. Uh, and if you want to learn about Excel, advanced Excel stuff as well for data analysis, take a courses by Chris Dutton uh, as well on, on Udemy. They're great. They're great. Yeah. 
All right. Do you see longevity in discretionary hedge funds versus the rise of quant, passive, and multi-strats? Yeah. So I think that hedge funds are in secular decline. I, I, I do. So hedge funds used to make a lot of money and used to do really, really well. Um, and then the government of the United States realized that it wasn't fair that hedge funds and these big mutual fund companies have better access to information than the rest of us. Uh, and so in 2002, there was a senator in New York City named Elliot Spitzer. And what he did was he, he created uh, Reg FD, which means uh, Regulation Fair Disclosure. And what, what Reg FD does is it makes sure that you and I, regardless of where we live in the world, we all have the same access to information um, at the same time that the big hedge funds and mutual funds do. And since then, hedge fund performance has gone down and so has mutual fund performance. But I think hedge funds are more in secular decline than mutual funds because a lot of hedge funds make money every month because of insider trading. That's right. And if you want, you can do a search on insider trading uh, on my YouTube page. And I have a bunch of videos on that. And I even have friends right, that, that, that I knew that did something wrong and they went to jail. And I was never involved in that, but I went to go visit them a number of times because when something bad happens to someone, I run towards you, not away from you. But a lot of people that make a lot of money in hedge funds are guilty of insider trading. Not all of them. The ones that think short-term that do well are, in many cases. The ones that are very, very long-term focused, like Tiger Cubs or hedge funds that came out of Julian Robertson's Tiger hedge fund, which he started in the 80s. The, these tiger cubs do well because they're very long-term focused. You know, as Warren Buffett said, the longer the view, the wiser the intention. And then what happened was after the 08 crisis, when a lot of uh, money managers or people that are involved in complex financial instruments, um, like credit default swaps, et cetera, what happened was the Obama administration went after a bunch of hedge funds. Uh, and the district attorney, I think in, in New York, the guy's name was Prebar at the time. And what happened was in 2008, it was tragic. It was an awful year. Uh, the world was, was within 24 hours of bank machines not working. It was awful. Uh, and, and so what happened was governments bailed out banks all over the world. And what really, really upset me and many people was that two years later in 2010, these bankers that got bailed out by governments, you know, they, they got record bonuses. And a lot of hedge funds made a fortune. But they also made a fortune because of insider trading. And so what happened was Prebara, uh, who was a, a government official at the time, I think he has a talk show now, really smart guy, entertaining too. Um, and by the way, if you watch Billions, the TV show uh, on Showtime, uh, Paul Giamatti, who's the district attorney uh, in that show, it's fiction, um, his character was kind of based on Prebara. And uh, the other guy, uh, Bobby Axelrod, the criminal, is based on Steve Cohen. Um, who ran a big hedge fund called SAC. And I don't understand why Steve Cohn's not in jail. I just don't get it. But anyway, check out that show if, if, if you want to be entertained uh, about, uh, about a, how some corrupt hedge funds work. So I do think that a lot of hedge funds um, are going to go out of business. And if you think about it, like hedge funds try to make money from short-term stuff. So if you're a short-term trader and you can't win in the long run, I promise you, it's like a casino. But if you're a short-term trader at a hedge fund, and earlier this year, you have all this COVID stuff. And so you're like, oh gosh, I'm going to short stocks. And you short it for a while. And then you see the price of oil is pretty low. And you're like, okay, I'm going to cover my short and go long now. And then all of a sudden, oil, the future price of oil was negative $40 at one point. You can't forecast that. You lost money. And also the market has rallied materially um, off the lows this year. And despite the fact that things are bad. If you're a hedge fund, you probably lost your shirt. You probably lost your shirt. Uh, and so I think that, as Warren Buffett said, the longer the view, the wiser the intention. And if you're a long-term investor, you'll do well. But if you're a short-term investor, eventually you'll go belly up. You will. It, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. If you're a hedge fund and you think long-term, then you'll be successful long run. And I think mutual funds are in secular decline as well. And I think you should buy ETFs instead of mutual funds because I think mutual funds are a scam. And 90% of mutual funds underperform the indexes and their fees are insanely high. You know, mutual fund fees can be three, four or 5%. And 
And then when you pay taxes on them at year end, you pay high taxes because mutual funds will buy and sell stocks. And if they made money, governments always make you pay more in taxes if you made money from short-term investments versus long-term capital gains. So the fees are much, much higher uh, for mutual funds. So why do they still exist? Because a lot of mutual funds have great relationships with uh, human resources departments in, in big companies. And they have a very strong lobbyist union as well. And they advertise a lot, a lot, a lot. You know, those feel-good commercials about, oh, if I save money for my retirement, I'll feel better. It's a scam though, because these mutual funds underperform what are called ETFs from great companies like Vanguard, for example, which have fees of 0.5% per year max, instead of three, four or 5% from mutual funds, which underperform anyway. So I would check those out. The bottom line is hedge funds are going into secular decline. So are mutual funds. What's taking over and what's going to make you more money in the long run, do your own research, is ETFs, exchange traded funds with lower fees that outperform with lower taxes as well, because they don't turn over their book or buy and sell a lot within a given year, unlike mutual funds and hedge funds. All right. Next up is, and the correlation too between financial instruments has gone up a lot. Like because a lot of these computer-based algorithms are trading a lot, a lot of stocks go up and down together, right? So it's, it's hard to generate what's called alpha, meaning outperform the market because the correlation, the movement of, of a lot of these stocks is in unison. All right, Craig is saying, uh, what is your view on Hertz stock uh, rise after uh, filing uh, for, for, you wrote 11 something, yeah. So what happened was in 1979, the United States government created uh, the bankruptcy laws and they set up 300 courts, bankruptcy courts across America. And there's different chapters within this bankruptcy law. The 11th chapter is how companies um, can file for bankruptcy and get protection for a while. So the way chapter 11 works, bankruptcy, is if you're having financial problems in your company, you can declare chapter 11. And what that means is there's this force field around you protecting you for four months and nobody can touch you for four months. And during those four months, what you do is you try to, I guess, talk to all the people you owe money to and say, hey, can I give you a little bit less? Otherwise you get nothing anyway. Um, and there's debt consolidation, whatnot that occurs. And the amazing thing is, and people don't realize this, but more than 70% of companies that declare chapter 11 bankruptcy, they emerge victorious and in a better condition in the near term and longer term, as long as there's no fraud, 70% or so. It's amazing. It's incredible. Uh, and so people tend to freak out when companies declare chapter 11. It doesn't mean they're going bankrupt. It just means they're getting bankruptcy prote protection. In terms of my views on that stock itself, uh, you'd have to do the work yourself. I'm so sorry. But take my complete financial analyst course or join my, me in my MBA degree program and I'll teach you how to analyze stocks. I'll never tell you what to buy. You know, I, I pride myself on humbly teaching out a fish instead of giving you a fish. Um, but, um, you know, if, if, if a bunch of other stocks in that sector went down globally, you know, like Avis, uh, as well as Localiza, for example, in, in, in Brazil, great um, rental company, I would roll up my sleeves on those ones as well. You know, because if, if, if they get crushed because a competitor declared Chapter 11, there might be an opportunity for you to be greedy when others are fearful and vice versa as well. And Avis is interesting because Avis is the number two uh, rental company in America. Number one has always been Hertz. Um, and Avis had a wonderful marketing campaign years ago. Uh, and they knew they were number two and they couldn't get to number one. It's just too hard. Hertz is too good. And so Avis's marketing campaign for years was, we're number two, we try harder. It was brilliant and self-deprecating too. All right. Next question is uh, from Darshit, who's asking, which, skill, which skills, which skill sets do I need to acquire to become a business analyst? Yeah. So a, a business analyst, if I think about it from a, a broader consulting perspective at, at a McKinsey uh, or an Accenture, um, they can analyze big sets of data. Now, a lot of people don't realize that what McKinsey does, great consulting firm, 
is they do a heck of a lot of quantitative analysis. You know, people think it's all qualitative Porter Five Forces stuff. No, they do a lot of analysis. And so I think what might set you aside is if you understand how to use a number of different business intelligence and business analysis software packages, like Tableau, uh, which is made, which is now owned uh, by Salesforce, or Hyperion, uh, which is business analytics software that Oracle owns, Cognos, which is owned by um, IBM, uh, as well as um, business objects or Crystal Reports, which is owned by, by SAP. And there's many others as well. Uh, and so I think if you learn software packages like that, among others, uh, that will set you aside uh, and help you in your career, regardless of what career you want to go into. You know, the, the, a lot of times the issue with, with business and business analysis is we tend to analyze the qualitative stuff. But if you don't analyze the data as well, then it's just an opinion. David is saying, hi, Chris. Um, which do you think is more important, the job field uh, you are in or the company you work for? So far, in my experience, the company you work for uh, has been more important. Yeah, yeah. Not all. It's not always the case. That all ships rise. You know, if you if you work at any search engine company, it doesn't mean you're going to be successful. There's, especially in tech, there's usually one or two that dominate, and then everybody else is irrelevant. Um, so I, I don't think it's the sector. I think it's the company itself. And when you analyze a company, you have to make sure that the founder is still there or still somewhat engaged from an advisory perspective. Because what happens is with really successful companies, particularly in the tech sector, uh, if, if a founder leaves, uh, investors should run for the exit. Uh, and, I, and I wrote about this um, years ago uh, in VentureBeat. When I worked in venture capital, there's this website called VentureBeat. So you can do a search on my name there and you'll see. I wrote an article, which is controversial at the time, which stipulates that when founders leave a company, investors should run for the exit. And the reason is because a company becomes successful because of its founder, initially, of course. And that founder does not give a damn about politics or bureaucracy. You know, they're, they're in it to change the world. And they don't care what anybody else says. You know, they've never cared about other people's opinions. And that's why they're successful. You know, like, like Elon Musk does not just run the company for shareholders. Um, Jeff Bezos does not run the company for shareholders. You know, he's extraordinarily long-term focused. He doesn't even get on the earnings calls. He doesn't care. He's long-term focused. And as Warren Buffett said, the longer the view, the wiser the intention. Now, what happens when founders leave a company and are not engaged at all, especially in tech, is if you work there and you're an executive, you're, you're focused on one thing, which is climbing the corporate ladder. And if you try to innovate while you're climbing the corporate ladder and create a brand new product and you fail, you're done. You're no longer climbing that ladder. A gravy train has gone, uh, complacency sets in. And what happens is big companies when the founders leave, they usually don't innovate as much. They buy companies instead of building companies. And I, I had a friend who worked at Hewlett Packard for a couple decades. And, you know, after the founders left HP, it was just disaster. It, nothing worked. They weren't innovative. They changed their advertising campaign about 15 years ago to invent, and they didn't really create anything. Um, and, and my buddy was there, and he said, Chris, I, I want to leave HP, and can you help me, please, with my resume? And I said, of course. Of course. I'm here for you. And I went through his resume with him, and I said, well, what have you learned in the past 20 years? And he said... I've just learned how to, I've learned how to navigate HP politics. And I thought to myself, my goodness, that's not a portable skill set. So it, it's, it's tragic, but a lot of times when, when you're an investor, like when, when all the founders leave, I never invest, okay? Because it's very, very hard uh, to turn a ship around. Now, if a company is becoming, if a founder leaves a company and then comes back, that's another matter, like with Apple, okay? But when founders leave, Innovation dies, and only one turnaround works in tech basically per decade. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it's hard. It's hard. And once a technology company starts becoming a little bit less relevant, it's too late. They're done. It's a slippery slope. Slippery slope. And so, you know, it, it, it's hard. It's hard. Only like one or two turnarounds work, again, uh, every decade uh, in, in tech. 
it, it, it's, it's tough. It's tough. So, but I've got an example of one actually. This is for my, my MBA degree students we're doing. Lou Gertzner, he worked at McKinsey for a year. Right, we'll just stick with this angle. It's fine. He worked at McKinsey for, um, oh, there we go. He worked at McKinsey for years. And then Lou Gertzner left McKinsey to go to IBM. In the early 90s, people thought IBM was going to go belly up. Uh, and Lou Gertzner actually turned it around. Um, again, there's only one or two turnarounds that work per decade in tech. But he turned around IBM. It was brilliant. And what Lou Gertzner did, uh, and I went to school with his son, um, who passed away recently, it's sad. Um, but, but Lou Gertzner, what, what he did was he realized that at IBM, they can't be successful longer term if they're going to sell hardware because the profit margins suck. There's too much competition and too much inventory can destroy your company. It's true. It's true. Like for, the video game industry actually went belly up. Another, another prop here. This is for my, my MBA students. But the video game industry went belly up because they made too many of these cartridges, um, which destroyed the, the entire sector in the 80s until Nintendo came back and, and improved it. I can talk about this if you want to. This is actually, um, there's hundreds of thousands of these buried in the desert, and I bought this on, on eBay. It was buried in the desert, kind of cool. Um, but yeah, hardware margins suck, and inventory can kill a company. It almost killed IBM. And so what Lou Gertzner did was he said, you know what, man? Let's just do software, because software margins are high, meaning uh, you make more money off it. There's no inventory problems with software, because it's virtual. And also, let's do consulting, like Accenture. And I know this well because I worked when I worked at Accenture. I worked in uh, 97, 98. The client was Nations Bank, um, and Nations Bank and Bank America were merging. And IBM were, was there uh, in Charlotte, where I was. IBM Global Services. I was hired by B of A to do the merger, and so was Accenture. And the brilliance of the IBM consultants is they used their consultants as a distribution channel to sell software at low prices, lower prices. Uh, and so when I was competing against them, when I worked at Accenture, it was frustrating, and I respected them, but it was frustrating because they got a lot more work than we did at Accenture because they were able to offer software as well, which was absolutely brilliant. And it was a smart move by B of A uh, to, to hire two consulting firms because competition is always good for the consumer or co-opetition, I should say, cooperation and competition. It was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And, and my gut is that Accenture is going to be one of the biggest acquirers of software companies over the next couple decades because I think they're learning that this business model at IBM works exceptionally well. All right. Next question is, thank you for your, your time answering my, my question on merger arbitrage. You're most welcome. A quick follow-up. What would be an intern slash analyst in the merger arbitrage focus on? What would they focus on? Fundamentals or, or valuation? Yeah. So I, I think that if, um, like, not the highest level, high-end uh, end level work, you'd be doing a lot of PowerPoint slides, but you might be doing some financial analysis with an Excel or data entry. Um, and so I think that if you want to impress people and you're getting an internship uh, at an investment bank, for example, uh, or, or a hedge fund in M&A um, event-driven stuff and merger arbitrage, uh, take my complete financial analyst course or take my MBA degree program. You know, both of them have a 30-day 100% money-back guarantee. All right. All right, give me um, one second, guys. I need to do just a quick little spot check here. Okay, thank you. I'll be right with you. Hold on. Um, all right, hold on a second. All right, give me one second, guys. All right, we're good to go.
uh, global business and technology uh, is through social media by adding value. Way to add value, I think. Customer support call. Uh, but what happens is after this is done, we make a podcast out of it. So we repurpose it that way. We also repurpose it by making seven individual vlogs for the next week based on the seven best questions that we want to use. We also repurpose the content by making Instagram videos uh, as well as Twitter videos uh, and that sort of thing. So I think that's staying up to date at business analysts and entrepreneurs and CEOs. And us. All right, next question is, can you please elaborate on the concept and importance of change management and how I can become a change agent within the organization? Thanks in advance uh, for your answers. Yeah, I remember when I worked at uh, Accenture, uh, there was a division called uh, Change Management Services or CMS, which I joked stands for chaps making slides. <laughs> um, but, but, but they just focused on I improving processes within a company. Um, so I, I would say there's a lot of fluff involved with that, though. I, I would look at business processes, but make sure you can quantify it as well. Because if you don't back it up with data, then it's just it's not a, it's just an idea. It's not a thesis. So wh whenever you want to uh, make changes, make sure you can quantify it from an expense perspective uh, or a, a profit margin perspective. That's what I would say. And the best way to do that is to start to leverage uh, data analytical products like Tableau, for example, from, from Salesforce, uh, as well as artificial intelligence and any other data analysis products uh, that, you, that you feel passionate about using. All right. Juan David, how are you, man? So Juan David is 17. He lives in Chicago. Um, he and his mom uh, immigrated from uh, Venezuela a couple of years ago. He's written a best-selling book um, called Generation Optimism, which I have, and I'm honored to say I wrote the, the foreword for it, as long, uh, along with the Chicago Tribune, calling him a renaissance man. He's also given two TEDx talks. Did I mention he's 17? Juan, great to have you. Uh, and you wrote, I hope you and your kids are having a great summer. Th things, are, things are okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Melody in the house. Melody is a wonderful teacher from Atlanta, Georgia, and she's got a couple courses she's just about to publish on Udemy uh, as well, and, and she's wonderful. So Melody wrote, Chris, I hope you're having a fantastic day. Uh, I know I am, thank you. It's always great to have you. I just finished recording everything for the class. I should be able to submit tonight to Udemy, woo! That's awesome, that is awesome. I can't wait to see it. Uh, next week when it gets approved and it's live on Udemy, let me know because uh, I want to go to it and check it out here uh, live. Thank you. And congratulations. I know you worked your, 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 your tail off on that. And congratulations. It feels good. Eh? It feels good when you hit that publish button. Um, and Melly is saying, uh, I'd love some feedback. And I'm also doing this giveaway on Facebook um, on, on June 19th. You can follow me uh, on um, lovelit01 on Twitter. Okay, let, let me do that right now. I'll do, I'll do it right here. Okay, lovelit01. Take a screen prints and I will follow you. Thank you. Awesome. And then you can follow me on Loving Literacy on Instagram and Loving um, uh, uh, Literacy on Facebook. Awesome. Awesome. Tell you what, next week uh, during this webcast, um, ask a question early on so I get to it, please. Um, give me the name of your Udemy course um, and then on your Udemy profile page, put links, which you can do to a lot of these social media channels. I don't think you can do Instagram, but you can certainly do Twitter uh, as well as uh, LinkedIn uh, and, and Facebook. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll go to your, your landing page, your, your, your profile page on Udemy. I'll check out your course. Um, and then I'll also check out your, your social media strategy if, if you want me to. Thanks. And then you wrote, I posted this on LinkedIn, trying to do a collaboration with Scholastic now. Awesome, awesome. And then you said, I've been using your, your networking book. And you said, I, I do have a YouTube channel. That's awesome. I, I love it. I love it. I love it. And I can't wait to, we'll do a case study on you next week if, if you want to, if you want to. Uh, and we'll get you some promotion for your, your course as well because I know you've been working hard on it. Um, I can't wait to check it out. So again, what I'll do next week, if you want me to, is ask a question early on um, and post the link uh, to, uh, or just actually, you're not allowed to post links. So what you'll do is tell me, tell me, uh, check out my Udemy profile and I'll go to your profile page on Udemy. And I'll check out your course and all your social media channels from there. 
Uh, but I'm, I'm excited for you. Congratulations. I know you worked really hard on this. Okay, next one is uh, uh, Mamadou is saying, Hi, Chris. Uh, how are you and your family? We're, we're okay, thanks. We're good. We're good. Uh, and then you said, uh, I was watching your webcast number 50 and your sister was sweet. Thanks for all the good content you're providing us. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's right. That's right. She was on number, um, it was last summer. My goodness, about a year ago. Last August, I think. Yeah. Uh, and, and I had her on the, on the webcast as well um, it, from my parents' apartment in Mississauga, Canada. Yeah. No, she's great. Her name is Elizabeth. She gave me this when I was younger, and I'll never throw it out. I'll, I'll show you. Hold on a second. It's right, right here. Go get here. She gave me. She gave me a Smurf when I was a little kid. I I, I love Smurfs. I guess for anybody in Europe, is the Schrumpf called or something. Yeah. But but she gave me this uh, in, in for Christmas when I when I was a kid, and I still have it. Yeah. This guy puts me, I take him every, I don't throw anything out. I, I am that guy. Drives my wife crazy. Um, I, all my old clothes, everything. She said, I know you'll never leave me, Chris, because you hate change. It's true, I do. But this is from Yaba, my little sister. We call her Yaba because, you know, saying Elizabeth is hard when you're not that intelligent and younger like me back then and even today. Yeah, no, she's great. She's great. All right. And then Melody is saying, uh, I only have two subscribers. Um, I, I can't customize my, my YouTube link until I reach uh, 100 subscribers. Oh my gosh. We got to change that right now. Okay. Um, well, I don't know your YouTube. Give me your YouTube name here. Uh, and if I see it, I'll go there right now. And all of us watching this will subscribe right now to get you to 100. Um, if I don't get to it today, then just next week, I'll, I'll make sure I ask everybody to do that. Yeah, yeah. Because we're all in this together. We're all in the team, right? All right. Um, oh, you did the ebook as well. Awesome. Awesome. And for anybody who wants to write a book, um, you can use my template. It's free. It's easy to use. Um, and again, anybody can write a book. Uh, and imagine bringing a book to a job interview or a meeting with a customer that you wrote. How badly do you want that job or that customer? I'll show you how to get actually. So you go to um, haruneducation.com. This is free slash and ready for this this is all lowercase all one word right book all one word you hit enter and it takes you here and then you click here to download a template and this book template it's in microsoft word format you can download it here from dropbox cat all it is it's one pages of instructions to get your book on amazon for kindle uh, the print version of amazon uh, this is an older web link but it automatically gets forwarded to the right one and then here uh, in audio format on audible.com, all free. And then just get a pay five bucks to get a cover made from fiverr.com. Oh, use uh, ultracon22. That's her link. She's great. She's based in Bangladesh. She makes all my, 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 um, my, my book covers and, and tip her well, please. Um, and this, the rest of this is just uh, my, my template. You just fill it in. It's really easy. Legal stuff here, whatever. Um, dedication. You, you can't get a better dedication to dedicate to your parents. Um, and then here is just all the other stuff from the book, yada, yada. And then this is Microsoft Word. You right-click after you've written it, and this automatically updates the table of contents. And then you publish it. It's fun. Anybody can do it. And it, it, it feels so good writing your, your, your first book. Yeah, it's awesome. Let me know when it's out, Melody, because I will buy it. Uh, and I have a rule. None of my students can give me their book. I have to buy it. And I've got a lot of them. They're not here today, but I, I got a bunch as well. Um, so yeah. All right. Um, and then Ari is saying, Hey Chris, uh, I'm an equity research analyst at a small investment publication shop. Is it worth trying to open a hedge fund, uh, or an SMA business? I know you did this uh, in the past. I, I love stock picking. Yeah. I, I wouldn't do a hedge fund, um, unless you can get one or two anchor investors that are extraordinarily long-term focused and are cool with you investing for five or 10 years from a long-term perspective. Yeah, that's, that's what I recommend. Um, and I have a course on Udemy. It's called the Complete Stock Course or Complete Stock and Hedge Fund Course, I think. Um, I, I renamed it recently. I was playing around with SEO. You, you can check that out if you want. Thanks. Uh, yeah. All right, and thank you, Melody, for that. The, the, the congrats, appreciate that. Uh, 
And, and then uh, Manas is saying, uh, hope, hope you're good. Thank, Manas, thank you very much for all the, the social media attention this week. I appreciate it. I always do. You wrote, did you have uh, your book delivered by Amazon for free? Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, w whenever you buy a book on Amazon that's paperback, um, look at the last page because you'll find the date it was made and where it was made. Um, so here on the on the left coast, west coast, the United States where I live, tax code feels like the wet left coast. It's brutal, man. Um, I am thinking about moving. Uh, but here on the left coast, when you buy a book from Amazon, it gets printed in a place called San Bernardino. Uh, and then what happens is it then it ships to you. So when you buy books on Amazon, a lot of times it hasn't been printed yet, like soft cover once. If you buy a book or any of my books in Europe on Amazon, uh, if you look at the, the, the back, the inside cover of the last page, it says the date and it's usually printed in Poland. So it's, it's a brilliant setup by Amazon. Um, it's, it's a win-win for them and for you as well. It doesn't cost you anything. Yeah, they keep about half the profits. Yeah, it's a business. All right. Um, and then Melody wrote, that give and take book that I mentioned earlier is amazing. It started to make me think about the importance of giving first. Now, sometimes you don't know uh, you're a taker until you read the book too. Yeah, no, it's a great book. It's a great book. And, and it's been true and prophetic since the beginning of time. Give and you'll receive. Yeah. Jose is saying, hi, Chris. Hope you're well. Likewise. Uh, thanks for being here today. I know some may expect it uh, by now. It's webcast number 94 you wrote, but we shouldn't take it for granted. Uh, so I appreciate you being here and giving us your time. Th thanks, Jose. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. God bless you. Thanks. And my son Matthew's favorite baseball player is Jose Batista, who played for the Blue Jays. And he hit a game-winning home run that got the Blue Jays into the playoffs uh, in 2015. And I bid on that ball in an auction. And I kept bidding up, 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 up. And then somebody beat me to it. Breaks my heart. But, yeah. Thank you. Octavian is saying, Chris, your webcast is by far the most uh, informative webcast I've ever attended. Thank you. Thank you. And you wrote, even today, you provided with so much value. Thank you. And God bless you, sir. Thank you. And God bless you way, way more. Thank you. It's fun. It's fun. Unfortunately, we only do three hours now. Uh, but I, I remember, um, and Melody will laugh about this. It was October 31st. It was Halloween 2019. And I, I did nine and a half hours straight without getting up once. Um, and I didn't realize it was nine and a half hours. I was just loving it so much. It's like playing a video game you love. Like Time becomes irrelevant. Time becomes irrelevant when you love doing what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, and then you wrote, uh, Melody wrote, congratulations on my, my 20th anniversary. Uh, hope you uh, and your wife had fun. No, no, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. It was good. Yeah, we were supposed to have gnocchi, uh, but we didn't order from a gnocchi restaurant. We actually got um, ceviche. It was good. And I bought Christine these, these rose, these flowers, actually, that the real flowers. And they last for 365 days. And you can't water them. But they're, I guess they're somewhat engineered. I don't know. But you can get them. They're in a cool black box. You can get them on, on Amazon. It's pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then Christine bought me, um, she got me a card and a lot of dark chocolate. I love dark chocolate. It's an antioxidant. Uh, my favorite kind of chocolate actually is, is salty sweet. I love that combination. And then Willa D says, how do you gain accreditation uh, for, for my courses online? Your, your courses. Yeah. I looked into it and I don't ever want to do it. Um, I don't, I don't think it, it's worthwhile because the, the problem with education is governing bodies are so bureaucratic and they tell you what you can and can't teach. And they're part of the problem. Uh, I want to be part of the solution humbly if I can. So I wouldn't look into accreditation. I, I don't think it's worthwhile. Yeah. All right. Um, and there's, it's, it's really fragmented globally too. Like there's different accreditation bodies all over the world and they charge thousands of dollars and they don't really do much except put a stamp of approval. So I don't need some governing bureaucracy anywhere in the world telling me what I can and can't teach. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Um, Melody is saying, um, in all the time I've watched your show, I would never have known there was a treadmill there. Yeah. It's cool, man. It's cool. It's um, it, it, it helps to keep me um, somewhat sane, I guess. Uh, helps me get my steps in. Um, I've actually, I didn't really, I didn't have it there until actually a couple of weeks ago. I put it back, uh, which which has actually helped me to um, 
I lost like seven pounds or something. Like I get like 15, 20,000 steps in without even thinking about it because of this thing. It's it's awesome. It's amazing. And it's cheaper too than the other ones because there's no rails at the side. Um, and it works well with my levitating desk, uh, which is fun. I got some new posters too. This I actually got 20 new ones. Uh, and so I'm going to change them each week. Um, so I had the Michael Jordan one for far too long uh, up here. So I, I changed it. Um, I've got a great Theodore Roosevelt one here. It says, believe you can, and you're halfway there. And Lao Tzu is down there, which is the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Um, and then right back here is, is one of my favorite quotes ever from, from Seth Godin, um, who's a wonderful marketing guy. And he said, you have everything you need to build something far bigger than yourself. I believe it. I believe it. He's great. Read Seth Godin's books if you can, if you care about marketing. All right. All right. And then Gagan. Hey, Gagan. Say, hey, Chris. Uh, belated happy marriage anniversary. Thank you. We celebrated our 20th recently. Um, hope you had a, a great time. Uh, loads of blessings and, and good health to your family. Thank you. Uh, and likewise. Likewise, same to you. Okay. My MBA degree is not Master of Business Administration. It's actually MBA stands for Married But Available. No? Just kidding. I'm kidding. This never comes off. This is for life. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, and Paul is, is saying um, micro credentials are the future of education in the college system in Ontario. Dude, you, you've got to be the same Paul Papadopoulos. I, you were my brother's year, right? From uh, in, in Canada. There's got to be. There's there's no way. That has to be you, right? You were the, the champion swimmer uh, that was um, three years. Uh, Couple, you're 50 or 51 in my brother's class. It has to be you. Too much of a coincidence. If it's not, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, but if, if, if it is high and if it's not, I, th hi as well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Fred is saying hi. Hey, Fred. Hope all, hope all is well, man. Uh, Haman Chu is saying congrats on your marriage anniversary, Chris, and God bless. Thank you. And I love all those little emojis you, you put there as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, and uh, Tapang is saying, hi, Chris. God bless. God bless you more. Oh, my God. Dude, Eileen is one of my students, okay? Um, one, of, one of my MBA degree students. She's asking questions before I even read her name, okay? She, she's amazing. She's based in Atlanta as well. Uh, so, uh, Melody, you should meet with Eileen. You're both awesome people. Um, and Eileen runs a very successful business. But Eileen's last name is the best name in history. You ready for this? Drum roll. Her last name is Dio Gracias. Dio is God. Gracias, of course, is thanks. Thank God, or God thanks. I love it. Eileen, you put a smile on my face every time I see your name. And God bless your foremothers and forefathers for having that awesome name. And if I could change my last name to anything, um, I, that's probably what I would change it to. I love it. I love it. Thank you. Uh, and then Eileen wrote, thanks for sharing this, Chris. I needed to hear this. My, my pleasure. And then you wrote, I'm in the middle of a crisis uh, during these times and burning out. Uh, I need to look ahead. Yeah. And, and Eileen, like we have um, we have MBA degree office hours today. It starts at 11, 15 a.m., goes for a couple hours. And then we have one-on-ones. I hope I have a one-on-one -on -one with you because I'd love to talk to you more about this. Or, or even during the MBA degree uh, live Q&A, we can get on, on Zoom together. And, and I hope you're doing okay. I hope you're doing okay. Um, I don't know, know what kind of crisis it is. Um, yeah, and burning out. I know what you mean. So... I've been working insane hours and I found what's helped me out a lot recently is just exercising or just standing up. Like I, I have one of these, uh, these desks where I, where I can stand up. Um, and I've been doing most of my work now during, during the, the work week standing up. All right. So basically, um, I have a desk and you can get lots of desks like this. Uh, I went, I got from fully.com. Uh, and as I was mentioning before, I've got below me a, a treadmill as well. So I just roll off my, 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 my chair here. Uh, which I bought used. Um, it's called Herman Miller. I bought it used from a, a tech company. It went belly up here. Uh, and you can get these desks used as well. Um, and, and then the, 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 the walker I have is called Fitbill, F-I-T-B-I-L-L. -L. And it keeps me sane. That's an oxymoron coming from me, I know. Um, so that I can, I can produce more content uh, and, and just enjoy doing what I'm doing. Whistle while I work, so to speak. But I, I hope you're doing okay. Um, I, I know that you just took your, your, your company online. Uh, um, sorry, that's the alarm. We got to wrap this up. You just took your company online from offline at leveraging Zoom and 
I, I know things are going well, but I hope you're okay. And ask me about it in the NBA office hours if you want, because I want to I want to humbly help if I possibly can. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and God bless you as always. And Vitpole is saying good morning, Chris. Same to you. Uh, and then Solomon is saying, uh, why haven't we seen the housing market being affected during the pandemic, especially when a lot of people are unable to pay rent uh, and make their mortgage payments? Uh, another reason is because uh, a lot of companies are allowing people to pay back uh, their, uh, their, 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 their debts a little bit later, um, just given what's happened. Um, so so I, 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 we have to wrap up this call now. Uh, and so, uh, oh my God, hold on one second though. Paul Papadopoulos. Paul is saying that is me. Okay, I knew it was you, dude. I knew it was, I couldn't see the picture perfectly. And I don't remember you having a goat. 87, my brother graduated 87. I haven't seen you since 1987, but, I, but I, I remember you. Last time I saw you was 87, yeah. And you wrote, uh, we were roommates and we're in. So, Paul, um, not sure if you heard this. I uh, had a little bit some some uh, internet issues today, but um, it's amazing that that yeah. Thank you. I haven't seen you since 1987. You graduated with my brother. You're in the same class. You said you were roommates too years ago. I I do remember you. I remember you're you're a good dude. I remember that. Um, you're a big athletic guy too. I remember you're you're a championship swimmer. Uh, so thanks for joining us, man. And I hope to see you next week uh, as well. Um, and, um, so we're going to have to, uh, unfortunately wrap up the call right now. Cause I've got to do my, um, uh, MBA degree student, uh, Q and a, uh, as well as, uh, I got one-on-ones with my, my MBA degree students, but I want to thank you all for your time today. I'm very sorry about the technical issues. Uh, and Paul, did you hear me saying sorry? Like a Canadian sorry? It's not sorry Americans. It's sorry. Okay. Canadians say sorry a lot. So I say sorry a lot. Um, so I won't, promise you, I won't have the same technical issues, uh, next, next week. Um, but if, if you look at the, uh, just to make it easier for y'all to navigate this, but within 24 to 48 hours, if you come back to this YouTube, uh, video here and you look at the description field, I have my team set it up so you can click on any question. It'll go immediately uh, to the answer to save you time uh, as well. So anyway, thank you very much uh, for your time, everybody. Uh, God bless you all, uh, and have a wonderful weekend and, and thanks again. Take care. Hi, I'm Chris Haroon, and this MBA degree program is not what you think it is. It's better. This program is more than 25 years of business experience, all rolled into one easy to access online program. I've sold over 1 million courses in every single country. I worked at Goldman Sachs. I have an MBA from Columbia University, and I've worked in the venture capital, hedge fund, and consulting industries. I've also started many companies, and my courses have been featured in Forbes, Business Insider, CNN, and NBC. If you're ready to nail your next interview, get a better job, get a raise, start that business you've always dreamt of, improve the one you currently run, or better manage your personal finances, then this MBA degree program is for you. I can't begin to tell you how comprehensive this program is. It's got everything, including more than 300 hours of on-demand video. I would have to do one of those dramatic opening title crawls from a certain space movie just to show you. And check out all the amazing reviews from students 
who have already enrolled in this MBA degree program. This on-demand version of the program is only $499, and it's more up-to-date than many of these old-fashioned MBA programs, which cost you well over $100,000. Not to mention, they don't even teach you the practical concepts included in my program. Last but not least, there is a 30-day, 100% money-back guarantee. And because you can access this program from any device, meaning a desktop computer, or a laptop computer, or a tablet, or even your smartphone. It means you can comfortably fit it into your schedule. Even if you work full time, it's no problem. So if you're ready to unlock the key to your potential, then I'll see you in class.